the regular meeting of the City Council to order. And uh, as our first item of business, we will say the Pledge of Allegiance. We, we've got a guideline of three minutes. We take as much or as little as we need, but we do um, expect to have public comment during the um, Taylor Park sure. agenda item. Okay, good. Um, well, uh, I, I did attend the um, Park and Rec Commission meeting uh, last week where they uh, decided to approve the master, park, uh, master plan for Taylor Park and forward it to the City Council for your um, review and approval perhaps tonight. And I had some concerns about the plan, which I brought up then. Um, chief among them, uh, and I think they addressed some of these, but, but not all necessarily. Uh, removal of the van shell, um, the removal of the store garden, um, and then, of course, the construction of a new van shell with a plaza in front of it, the south end of the park, and also uh, the removal of 12, at least a dozen mature shade trees. Um, along with the insertion of the oval walkway. But, um, you know, I did attend the first meeting, when the first, second meeting, when, they, when they, the committee did the subcommittee on the, <clears throat> open the hearings on the master plan, but I, you know, busy with our work uh, on the planning commission, I didn't really go back. Um, but we spent, on the planning commission, we spent a year and a half on the city plan, we spent a year and a half on the housing plan study, a year and a half on um, uh, the Stebbins Market Catherine subcommittee. We spent more than six months on the stormwater regulations. And I'm a little alarmed to see how quickly this has been shepherded through the process. Um, and I really feel that it really hasn't gone through the steps it needs to go for your approval tonight. Um, Do you wish to, you're welcome to comment right now during public yeah. comment if um, you think it might be um, more pertinent to wait until after the presentation. Um, we can um, make sure that there's time. I don't know if it's been amended since they sent it to you. Um, if you it will be presented so you'll have a chance to see it in its current form. And, um, um, I'll hold it, but I did hand out a little, a little hand out to you all. Um, and. Uh, the public probably didn't get it, but um, something similar handed out to the, to the uh, members of the Park and Rec Commission. The, the photo of the van shell is actually in um, Bristol, Vermont, the historical van shell. And the lower photo is an historic postcard around 1918 of Taylor Park with the fountain in its floor, now restored once again. Um, and again, that's what we should be aiming for, that kind of quality, that kind of level of presentation for Taylor Park. Thank you. Are there any other public comments? Again, we're scheduled at 7.45 uh, to hear a presentation of the Taylor Park Master Plan, after which we'll be going into a discussion. So um, you're welcome to comment now, but um, the, there will certainly be time um, later in the agenda. I would yes. like to comment after the presentation. OK. Anybody else? OK, we'll move on to a very um, important agenda item. And this, um, I'll invite Maura Carroll, the B Vermont League of Cities and Town Executive Director, hello, <laughs> to come forward. And, oh, there's Al Al Alan. <laughs> this is Alan. I'm trying to Thank you. Great, and this is, um, this is an opportunity uh, for us, uh, for Vermont, to recognize 
the contributions um, that Alan Rob Toy has made um, to our community. With that, I will turn it over to Maura to make this presentation. Thank you very much, Your Honor. It is a pleasure to be here this evening. I may be the one that has the most fun tonight because it is always delightful to be able to honor local officials for the work that you all do day after day, year after year. It isn't always easy what you do, but it is very important. And so we all owe you a great debt of gratitude for the commitment you have to your community, and certainly we want to thank you for that. We do have an award on behalf of the LCT that we would like to give to Mr. Alan Rob Toy. And if I may, I would like to read what the, um, what the nomination form said, because I think it is very informative about how Mr. Rob Toy has served this community. For 40 years, Alan has demonstrated a community spirit that is second to none. Most notable is his ability to cut across demographic barriers. From the CEOs and general managers of prominent local businesses, to the excavators and contractors who make the world go round. Alan's cell phone has all their numbers and they all take his calls. Alan got his start in local government in the mid-1970s through a job training program for disadvantaged youth. The second oldest of 10 kids that shared a two-bedroom home, Alan demonstrated a work ethic that quickly caught the eye of the foreman, and he was hired full-time right out of high school. Over the next 40 years, Alan provided the leadership and cultivated the loyalty to get guys to willingly answer the phone in the middle of the night and go fix a water line in the dead of winter. His staff had never asked for extra pay to answer the phone whenever it rang, Instead, he fostered a mystique about the St. Albans Public Works Department, and they felt privileged to be on the team. In today's world, it can sometimes be fashionable to denigrate public servants. This dynamic recently played out on a Facebook page when somebody innocently asked, is there such a thing as a good public servant. Name one and why. For some time, the naysayers predictably derided public servants until somebody replied, what about Alan Robtoy? Isn't he a public servant? After which a litany of uplifting Alan stories flowed forth. Elderly ladies described Alan fixing sewer backups on Christmas Eve. Former employees who were good kids that had made a bad choice described Alan giving them a job that turned their lives around. And local business owners and hospitals described Alan working all night to get their water turned back on by morning. For 40 years, Alan has demonstrated the intrinsic value of working hard at work worth doing. Day in and day out, he has excelled at helping people solve the problems important to them. In a world where we too often encounter a can't-do attitude, Alan's can-do attitude has exemplified the community spirit that is essential to a long career in public service. It is my privilege to offer to you and extend our congratulations for the Vermont League of Cities and Towns Lifetime Achievement Award.
Dominic was sure to tell me he had a lot on the agenda tonight. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, just very briefly, because I'm not much for public speaking, I would say to you, um, I, I think it, it literally was my destiny to, to do what I do for a living. Uh, I had uh, my grandfather had worked here for a number of years, I had a number of uncles. Uh, uh, my mother's brothers who had worked here for a long period of times during the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Uh, so I literally think it was in my DNA. But uh, I don't think anyone lasts 40 years at any job without, uh, without having a support staff. And, and I had some really solid, good people over the years. And uh, some of them stayed 25 and 30 years themselves. Um, the list is too long for me to name, and I'd be afraid to leave someone out. Uh, they all actually know who they are. Um, I'm equally as proud of the fact, to be honest, that uh, I've always been able to, uh, I've worked for like seven or eight city managers, and uh, I've kind of always tried to fly under the radar. I never sell out public praise. Uh, I, when Michelle Monroe called me and says, hey, Alan, I got a couple of questions. I kind of tense up a little bit, and then I finally give in to it. I'm not, I'm not real big on that. And, uh, but I really do appreciate this. I'll, I'll say it. I'm very, I'm very humbled by it and uh, very appreciative. So thank you very much. Thank aspire to be the public servant that you are, Ellen. Thank you. And I know that you don't like to be the center of attention, so thank you for <laughs> indulging us tonight. And Maura, thanks uh, to you and VLCT for all that you do to support us. We appreciate it. Thank you. It's our pleasure. All right. Ellen, you want to talk about stormwater? <laughs> <laughs> Um, our next item of business is the introduction of a stormwater utility program. Um, we've got a couple of presenters, including Chip Sawyer and Julie Beth Hines from Orion Planning and Design. Thank you. Good evening. Welcome. We have a presentation um, that will show up on the screens. While well, that's coming up, um, I'll just start out by saying that, um, you know, we've known that uh, the state has some water quality issues uh, dating back quite a while, especially our watershed here in the Lake Champlain Valley. And a lot of that responsibility of dealing with those um, extend to the city. We're all in on this. Everyone has to do their part. And I think some in the city are aware that <clears throat> we've, um, we've been doing some planning and preparation for action for some time now. This presentation tonight about stormwater utility is a major step forward in that effort. And we know in the city that it's mostly stormwater. It's large amounts of water that, that fall during a precipitation event. And due to speed and due to what they pick up on the ground, <coughs> Uh, stormwater impairs our brooks and pollutes St. Albans Bay. And we also know that we are required to do many things under our MS4 permit with the state and ultimately with the US EPA. We have programs and projects that are, we are getting ready to be put into place. Some of them are um, already in place. But construction and maintenance of stormwater treatment facilities is uh, on the horizon for us. Regulation of stormwater management of, um, on, on developments, both private and public, of a certain size, something that we'll have to engage in. Uh, protection and reestablishment of stream corridors, and actually part of that is, uh, uh, we'll have a hearing on that tonight. Technical assistance to property owners who'd like to treat stormwater and runoff on their own land. That's a service that we would provide, but also it's actually in our permit to provide that service, so we need to figure that out and stormwater outreach efforts. Uh, another thing that 
given our brothers, we would do, given the resources, but it's, it's also one of the things we're, per we're permitted and, and required to do under our permit. So we've developed a proposal for a stormwater utility, introducing it tonight. Um, we seek to establish this utility starting on July 1st of 2018. It would be a proportional charge on all property owners in the city with more than 500 square feet of impervious surface on the property. And it would be um, actually be a quarterly fee billed on the city's water wastewater bills. Those bills go out quarterly. To date, um, we've been working on determining a budget to be funded by the stormwater utility fee. We're focusing on what are, right now, what are the new things we'll be bringing forward to, for the city to do its part for water quality. And the costs are all directly related to the MS4 permit, and uh, they're distinct from anything else we're doing. But certainly from water, wastewater, street operations, this is all the new things that we knew were coming. We sought consultant assistance on the program, the ordinance, and customer file. Uh, Julie Beth Hines here tonight from Orion Planning and Design. Julie Beth has a lot of uh, background and expertise in Vermont. She used to be a planner in Vermont, and she's actually helped set up stormwater utilities in this state. And now she does it all over the country. Wayne Elliott, who you know from Aldrich and Elliott, has been helping us, and Andres Terizo and, and his shop. They've provided services, services to the city before, and they've also been working on helping to uh, get this utility ready for your consideration. So I will turn things over to Julie Beth. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here tonight. Um, why a stormwater utility? Why charge a fee for the fact that it rains? Um, St. Albans, like many cities with an MS4 permit in Vermont and elsewhere, has financial obligations that are new, um, that have not been recognized as a separate category before, that are discrete and separate from what you do for water, wastewater already from, from your streets department's costs, and that need to be tackled. Um, stormwater fees, which are charged, as we'll talk about, on impervious surface, have been used nationally. There's a little map here of the communities in the United States that charge a fee um, based on impervious surface for all taxable and non-taxable properties in their jurisdiction. And that's dedicated in the same way as an enterprise fund for water wastewater pays for those services to ratepayers. It's dedicated to those expenses and activities that are directly related to the cost of managing stormwater runoff in the city. Like water wastewater fees, it provides a stable and equitable funding source for the city to deal with those obligations under the MS4 permit. Um, and again, it's, it's a best practice in Vermont and nationally for the communities that are dealing with these costs. Um, we'll talk a little bit about other Vermont communities that have made that move um, since 2001 and, and where they land in the spectrum. Again, the idea is you create a stormwater utility and a fee to have a reliable, predictable, and fair source of income to deal with money that you're going to spend because the state requires you to do certain things when it rains. If we could just magically turn off the rain, these costs would not accrue. We can't magically turn off the rain, so this is money that has to be spent as a result. Again, it's, it's quarterly on water wastewater bills. And distinct from water and sewer, of course, water, the more you use, the more you pay. You have a base charge, and then you pay based on usage. Um, the way we measure use in the world of stormwater utilities is how much impervious surface you have on your property. And again, that, that cost then accrues in the same way that churches and nonprofits pay, a, uh, pay water bills for the water that they use. All property um, is, will pay a stormwater utility fee. And that's well established in Vermont law um, that those properties are subject to that fee as well. So elsewhere in Vermont, we have four municipalities that are charging, uh, that have a stormwater utility and have a stormwater utility fee in effect. Again, those fees are dedicated to um, things the municipalities do that are discreetly related to their MS4 permits and stormwater management. Uh, Burlington's was established in 2009. The current monthly charge for a single family residence, and again, we, we talk about that as our equivalent residential unit, 
Burlington's charge is six sixty a month. Um, Colchester's is newer. They uh, established their fee in twenty sixteen. Right now, they're charging four thirty six a month. South Burlington's the oldest of those. The fee went into effect in two thousand three, and right now it's darn close to Burlington's. It's six sixty nine a month. Um, South Burlington is also now providing stormwater services to Shelburne. Um, under a contract basis, where Shelburne's charging a fee, but the services are provided by South Burlington's stormwater utility. And Williston uh, was about 2012, and they're right now at 425 a month. So the components of a fee-based program, it is, there's nothing mysterious about this. It's, again, very close parallel to water and wastewater. First is to establish a budget. What are the costs that are directly attributable to those MS4 permit obligations? And this is something working with Alan and Chip and Dominic, we've been able to sort of establish a budget, a prospective budget of, of the upcoming um, stormwater related costs. The next fun thing is to determine an ERU or equivalent residential unit. And this is taking the brand list and mapping of impervious cover that um, Andres Teresa and his group at Watershed Consulting Associates have done, and determining the typical size of a single family, typical single family property in St. Albans. And we establish that as one equivalent residential unit, and we basically make the charge based on that, um, based on how much impervious cover the other properties have. And we'll show some examples of that. To enact this and charge the fee, the city council must adopt an ordinance authorizing the fee. Um, the, the ERU charge can be uh, adjusted at any time. That's by city council action. And the council also can adopt and authorize credits um, for those who do more to treat the stormwater on site and also to incentivize uh, practices that we'd like to see, such as using rain gardens or treating residential runoff, the things that will get the city credit towards those phosphorus reductions that the state is requiring. So this, again, this idea of the ERU, or equivalent residential unit, impervious surface, how much pavement and rooftop you have, which sheds water when it rains, is the proxy that we use for your use or your impact on the city's stormwater system. In a Vermont stormwater utility regimen, all properties, and taxable and non-taxable, that have 500 square feet or more of impervious surface would pay a fee. That also includes, in addition to the non-taxables, it includes uh, the state, it includes um, utilities like Green Mountain Power, it includes transportation facilities i.e. railroads. Um, this is intended to reflect the cost of, of two things. One is managing that runoff from developed properties, but it's also the shared cost of keeping the city's roadway network managed. Um, we're not proposing at this point, looking at the city's uh, grand list and the profile of costs, to charge the city for its roadway system, but the city owns and maintains roadways that are essential to all of the property owners in the city. And there's a significant cost to manage the stormwater from the city's transportation system. So that's part of what you are charging for when you do a stormwater utility. Again, the city council has the option to um, allow credits for different practices that treat stormwater on site, which again is reducing the burden on the city's system from managing stormwater. So the first step that we've been looking at um, in depth this week is establishing an ERU, or equivalent residential unit. And this is the amount of impervious surface for a typical single family house or a structure that's a duplex or triplex in St. Albans. Quick example, St. Albans, the, the typical house has somewhere around 23 to 2400 square feet of impervious surface. So that's going to be rooftop, driveway, and other paved surfaces, such as decks and sheds. St. Albans also has, and this is a little unusual in Vermont's municipalities where I've looked at this, and, and a little, not atypical, but it's, it's um, a feature we have to be aware of. There are a lot of residential properties that have a lot more than the typical impervious surface. Um, we have quite a 
substantial group that are in the 5,000 square feet, five to 6,000 square feet and up. Um, again, historically, you've got a lot of older farmhouses that were added on to over time. We also have a lot that have been converted to duplex or triplex. It's probably worth looking at um, how those very large impervious surfaces are charged um, relative to the smaller, more typical, um, you know, two to 3,000 square foot properties. So if we take the, the typical of 2,400 square feet-ish of impervious surface as our starter point for an equivalent residential unit, what does that mean for other types of properties? Here are a couple of examples. This is a condo with about 14,400 square feet of impervious. That's about six equivalent residential units. And I believe that is an eight unit building. So if you take the six ERUs, divide them up by the eight owners of those condos, they would pay 0.8 ERUs per person would be their bill. On the right is a typical commercial. This one has just about 10,750 square feet of impervious, so about a quarter acre. Uh, that works out if 2,400 is our ERU, it's about four and a half ERUs per month. So they would pay four and a half times what a single family residential, a typical single family would pay. And so basically the process of establishing how much you pay is this process of taking your impervious divided by the ERUs and that's your bill. So it's multiples of what this typical single family would pay. Okay, so what does that mean for a range of property owners in the city? Again, looking at the typical single family home, where we're starting to land relative to the budget that Alan and Chip and Don have been considering and that Wayne Elliott's helped put some input onto in terms of upcoming costs, um, looking again at the flow restoration plan and others. Um, I think your monthly cost is probably going to land between four and five dollars per month. Um, that's again will be something that city council will need to consider in detail. But that's at that lower end of the range for Vermont municipalities. It's pretty typical nationally for a city of St. Albans size and complexity. And I think we're we're going to be somewhere in very much in that ballpark as the recommended monthly charge for a typical single family house. So what that means is $48 to $60 for a single, typical single family per year as a stormwater fee. Again, that would be charged quarterly, so $12 to $15 on a sewer and water bill. Looking at the, the largest homes, the, the properties that are residential, you know, single family in character, but have a whole lot more impervious surface, um, the range of that, they tend to be about two and a half times the amount of impervious as a typical single family. If you went with a straight ERU charge on that, you'd be looking at 10 to 12.50 a month or 120 to 150 dollars per year. There'll be a policy decision to be made around that, but there's definitely a group of single family properties that are substantially more impervious, have substantially more impervious than our typical homeowners in, in the city. The typical commercial range, a um, lot, lot of the properties in the city are have about 10,000 square feet of impervious. Um, those would be looking at 18 to $22 per month in this range. The larger commercial, we do have some big properties with big parking lots or, or large roofs. Um, the ones with about two acres of impervious are sort of in a group, they'd be looking at $160 to $200 per month. That is very typical of what Williston, Burlington, South Burlington was communicating to its, their business communities when those fees were imposed. Um, then we've got, and you will have some very large rate payers. One of the recommendations always is to sit down with them with their prospective bill and map and talk that through with them, talk through any credits that might be available, um, things that they might be able to do with their runoff on site to reduce their bill and make sure that you have those discussions before that first bill goes out. We've identified 
the largest rate payers. We're getting close to having them, and we'll be able to give Chip and Dom and all of you maps and resources to have those conversations. And then the condominiums, um, depending on the number of units, and this is very typical of what we saw in South Burlington, they could be paying anywhere from $2.50, $2.50 per unit per month to maybe closer to six where we've got a lot of stuff and impervious and fewer units. But nothing really too far outside the range of what single family homeowners would be paying. And in some cases, they would be paying less. There's a lot, I can say honestly from my experience, that it, it, as counterintuitive as this sounds, um, and I hope Alan can prevent anything being thrown at me, um, what do you get for your money if you're a rate payer paying another fee? Um, the values that we see in Vermont, one, this keeps the city way ahead on compliance. The state has looked very favorably upon and has rewarded the municipalities that have adopted a fee and are doing strong maintenance programs and strong investments because they know they've got the fees coming in and they can plan and budget to move ahead. One of the most important reasons to do this, having that dedicated fee where you know you've got a certain amount of revenue each year lets you leverage the grant funds that are available, the state revolving fund, the Ecosystem Restoration Program, all of those require some kind of match and the ability to know that you can pay back um, loans if you do choose to go the financing route. This is the way that you get that predictable revenue source that can be dedicated towards those expenses and it leverages a lot more money. Um, it does give you just an easier basis for planning those upcoming costs and how you're going to deal with them. It gives you more financing tools. You can borrow against the revenue from a stormwater utility. And your, your peer municipalities do that in some cases. Some do it only on short term. Some are using it on longer term capital financing. The other thing is you continue to build your city staff knowledge. You have an outstanding staff. Um, I hope to be half as accomplished as Alan Rottoy if I ever grow up and he is admired by all of his peers in this business in Vermont. Um, but having people at the city who are knowledgeable, who are ahead of the game on stormwater, property owners can pick up the phone and say, I'm having a problem with this permit, or I'm having a problem with my pond, who do I call? That genuinely building that knowledge and being more able to make those calls, answer those questions, really does provide a benefit to property owners, especially the business community, when they're looking at significant costs and having somebody like Chip or Alan who knows, who do I pick up the phone and call? How can we leverage some money to maybe make some improvements around this property is very, very valuable. Process and steps coming up. Um, council will need to adopt an ordinance if you choose to go this route, um, which we can is not a big lift to get that drafted. Um, it's well established in Vermont utility law. We know sort of where to put it and how. Figuring out the final fee, um, making sure that it's correct, that we've got the customer file correct, and that we're comfortable that the uh, information on impervious service is sound is very important. Um, and then as I've noted, customer communication really getting out to the people who would be most affected by the rates, um, making sure that they understand what's coming and when and why is very important, as well as the community as a whole. Um, I don't know if either of you want to speak to timing for implementation. Um, you know, we'll, we, we propose this idea. We'll certainly follow the council's leads. Staff's recommendation is to um, you know, we'd be happy to bring you a first reading of the ordinance at the next meeting if you so wish, and we're prepared to do so. I don't think we should waste much time in pursuing this idea if the council agrees it's the right way to go, because um, we have been well cocooned in the required planning stage right now, but it is getting to the point where the city needs to start doing some of the actual implementation associated with water quality. So staff's also uh, ready to bring forward a proposed budget to uh, get the customer file ready and, and um, put materials forward if the council would like to consider adoption of a budget and a fee. So interested in your thoughts? 
Great, thank you. This was um, a very clear presentation. Um, I appreciate the, uh, the content. Um, this is something that um, I've been aware of uh, discussions for many, many years. I think, Alan, um, will, I, I don't know when you first started I, I warning I first, us. I, I first started talking about uh, stormwater utility, some form of with Brian Sarles in 2003. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we went on to do the joint study with the town. Yeah. Uh, it seems like it was 2007 or so. Mm -hmm. So it's not, it's not like we rushed it. It's, it's, the need has always been there. It's just now the stormwater is up front and personal. And uh, and it's, it's, I think it's time we got to do something about how, how, you, how you pay for it. You, know? um, you provided. Um in the packet, a, a budget is that something that a proposed budget is that something that you wanted to get into this evening or? Um, we could if, if you have questions about it, certainly. Uh, but the budget, as uh, as presented, you'll see it it um, includes some some enhanced maintenance of of the treatment and other stormwater facilities we have. It includes continued planning to get. Uh, treatment projects to the stages of being shovel ready. Uh, we have a phosphorus control plan. I believe there's um, uh, there's some money set aside for that. That's actually linked to the TMDL that we've been talking about for Lake Champlain for years now. The city actually will have to come up with its phosphorus control plan of how we are going to re remove our share of the phosphorus that needs to be taken out of our segment of the lake. That goes along with our flow restoration plan, which we've already done for each of the brooks in the city to reduce the speed and amount of stormwater that hits the brooks during the storm. And in each, in each of those plans, there's, a, there's some conceptual projects uh, that could get us to our, our, our goals, the goals that the state has set for the city. But um, when you go down to the, some of the final lines in the budget near the bottom, the capital lines, that's where we, we have money that we're going to need to spend on final engineering, permitting right away for each of these projects. Mm -hmm. And then eventually the debt service associated with, with building these projects are in the budget. And it, this, this budget um, has been formulated with a mind toward what are the, thing, what are the new things the city is going to have to do and it totals around 360,000 um, in what you have right now. And um, could you also talk a little bit about um, credits and, and how that might um, look for um, property owners who are, um, maybe give it an example of yeah. what some of those activities might be to help reduce the charge. This is all based on the fact that the entire city, each and every one of us as, as a member of this community, shares these obligations. So every time, whether it's some big gravel wetland that we're going to build before a uh, stormwater system gets to a brook to intercept the water there, or whether it's a small rain garden that you build on your own piece of property, um, if it's on the list of things where the state and, and, the, and the feds can say, yes, this, this practice will reduce flows by this much and will remove phosphorus by this much, then that is counting towards the city's goals. That each and every one of these little things and each and every one of the big things is going to help the city get to where we're in compliance with our permit. So what's common with stormwater utilities is that when a property owner or a larger commercial, commercial property owner does some stormwater treatment right on site, um, it's recognized as, as moving the community toward its goal and the whole reason why the stormwater utility exists. So we will devise, we propose to devise a program by which um, if you adopt a certain number of practices that can treat a certain amount of the stormwater from your property, your uh, stormwater utility fee would be reduced. Because rather than having the stormwater utility finding a way to treat all of your storm water along with everyone else is you're actually treating some of it <coughs> right on your property. And that's the basis of the philosophy of the credit. Um, normally, you don't get to remove your storm water utility fee altogether because there are, you know, just to have the program running, you do have administrative costs, but there well, it are- It sounds there like are, the, the comment you made earlier that we all share the roadways, so yes. yes we, very much so. Exactly. 
Um, but there, the credit both recognizes what you can accomplish on your own property, but also it will be enough to incentivize doing things on mm -hmm. your own property. Great. Thanks. Um, council members, any questions? I, I just have a couple. So the $10,000 for personnel, that seems kind of low, especially the first year. It seems like there's going to be a lot of questions and concerns and people wondering if they're... Uh, the projects they are doing are going to qualify, et cetera, et cetera. So I guess my concern is this ends up being so big, we create a whole bunch of people going around the city making sure people are doing what they're supposed to be doing. So what I don't want to do is fund all these new city positions. I mean, it's only $10,000, but I can see how that could get out of hand pretty quick. I can see maybe that's a maintenance over, you know, after a couple of years, maybe it'll be that, but... Right in the beginning, I think it'll be more, but that's that's for you guys. But my other can, my other question is, um, does it, are we going to do it where a percentage of the property, as a base of a percentage of the property? So an example, I probably have 3,500 square feet of impervious surface. It's probably 35 percent of my property. My parents have 35 percent of their um, their 35,000 square feet. Or 3,500 square feet of impervious service, but it's probably less than 5% of their property. Mm -hmm. So does that take into account? I mean, I'm on 0.2 acres, they're on over an acre. Uh, normally they're set up that each square foot of impervious is counted the same. They all, it all adds up. And so there are various different ways that Julie Beth could speak to, but it's typical that um, even, you know, if you have a certain amount of square foot of impervious on your property, no matter how large the rest of your property is, that is the basis for your fee. Right. So someone that has, uh, it's 100% of their property and it's an acre, they're going to pay the same amount because you have to treat all the stormwater on there than someone that has 10 acres and only has an acre of it that's impervious. Um, generally speaking, yes. You would be charging the equivalent resident, the, the equivalent, you know, how many 2,400 square foot units of impervious do you have? That being said, typically a credit program will, in the way most communities, not just Vermont, but nationally, set up their credits, is based on what percent of your runoff do you treat on site before it leaves your property boundaries. Um, a lot of communities choose to allow a credit up to 50%. So if somebody, if so in your example, if you had 10 acres and an acre of impervious here and there, and you could show that you were treating 100% of that on site to the, you know, a certain design storm, uh, take your bill in half. It's gonna be an awful lot easier for you with the 10 acres to accomplish that than the poor guy with one acre and it's 100% impervious. So, typically the larger properties like that will get a larger, they have much greater ability to get credits mm -hmm. in the program. I would say that it's, it's, it's because of the properties. I mean, we all love the way the city's been built out. We love our dense downtown, our close-knit neighborhoods. Um, but it's because of those properties that are fully impervious that we need a stormwater utility that finds a more centralized spot to treat a lot of the stormwater mm -hmm. because you can't treat it on that piece of land. And we wouldn't want to see the city all dug up to make every property treat its own stormwater. Mm -hmm. It would be nearly impossible anyway. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Anything else? Mike? Could you just remind us what the consequences are if we don't comply with our MS4 permit and what the timeline would look like around that? We have uh, around 15 years left to treat, um, to get our stormwater flows during the storm down to like reduce it by 16% in, in Stevensbrook watershed, uh, for instance. We'll have about 20 years to reduce the amount of phosphorus from stormwater in the city by 25%. That's part of the Lake Champlain TMDL. You know, I actually haven't read up a lot on what happens to communities that don't comply. I'm sure it has a lot to do with fines and court orders and consent decrees and judges get involved and, you know, the city ends up, we end up getting taken out of the driver's seat, kicked out of the car to, to you know, get to finish the rest of our stormwater journey. I, I don't even think I'd like to contemplate not being in compliance. We've sort of been working toward making sure this city is, is uh, in compliance. Are all the uh, 
charges on the properties based on the budget that's presented. Yeah. Yes. And then um, on the quality of the treatment, one, the end result of what we're trying to do, that must be predicated on an amount of water going to the lake, is it not? Ultimately, all the water that falls in the city finds its way to St. Albans Bay or nearby. So, do the prices change as the rain events change? You know, a lot of our goals are built on models, and some of it's a black box. Um, I think if it got, it, it would have to be a severely different run of weather climate over time for the state to come in and open our permit back up and change all of our obligations. There's an assumption in what they've set down for us that things aren't going to vary drastically from year to year in terms of precipitation. So it is really based on what we've seen over the past several years in terms of rainfall. What about snowfall? That gets figured into it as well. Snow eventually melts and then sort of becomes, it's sort of, sort of a different way of looking at it, but it is still runoff. And so, um, you know, whatever we build for treatment will eventually be able to treat the melted snowfall once it hits the brooks and follows the same path as regular rainwater. Who has control over the charges, uh, for instance, in the budget that you presented here? Is this strictly city council doing this, or is this a state of Vermont mandating something? The, the budget's a response to the mandates the state's laid down for us, but it's a budget for the city council to um, adopt and change as it, as it I, I proceed as staff putting forward a proposal, just like the water wastewater budget. It'll go before the finance committee, and then before the full council, and it's similar to one of those budget processes. So the, the city council can um, add or detract from any of these figures that are in front of us under this FY19 proposal, um, and that would, as a result, change the charges that the potential property owners would pay. Correct. Okay. All the impervious square footage in the city is the uh, denominator, and our budget is the numerator. Yes. yes. Um, but yeah, it's actually pretty simple in that way. Thanks. Um, we are not looking to take action on um, this item tonight. This is a good introduction um, to the stormwater utility um, concept. Chip, you've mentioned that you would um, potentially be prepared to bring back a proposed ordinance at a future meeting. Um, is that, are you talking a yes. month from now? Is it or a couple months from now? Would, would it be? <clears throat> okay. Yeah, okay. Mayor, can I make a suggestion? Mm -hmm. um, I think, depending on what the rest of the council thinks, this is significant enough for us to warrant a meeting on its own, um, uh, or a hear or hearings to the public on its own, rather than inside of a meeting. Um, when you're when we're starting to assess additional taxes or additional charges. Uh, upon the property owners of the city of St. Albans. It certainly deserves more than just a quick review and a meeting. And I think that uh, it's going to take a lot more discussion, and I would want to hear a lot more expert opinion than I've heard tonight before I would want to vote on something. So if we could do it, I would gladly um, um, want to come to a meeting um, so that everyone has a chance to be heard on the subject. I, I think that's a great suggestion. Um, I don't disagree with that. I also um, would like to uh, do a deeper dive, um, of course, on a budget, and I wonder if we might have finance committee look at that um, at some point along the way, too, as, as we're uh, moving forward. So if um, we're not entirely sure about um, the timing. Oh, just a couple more comments to set the stage. There's a handful of things in here that are migrating out of the general fund. Um, for example, the um, we got in the planning and development budget this year, 35 grand or so. 30 grand for the stormwater planning. Yeah, so that moves over here. Um, some of the debt service uh, moves over. So there's an impact on the general fund, um, depending on when we have this discussion. Um, so. That's what we've been trying to do is, is 
tee this up enough that we have a sense of what's likely coming down the pike in July, because that's important context for how we approve the general fund budget. Um, I'm not sure we have enough information to recommend to the council whether it's ready yet for December okay. or whether we want to um, put it on hold and do that to get the general fund budget done. Okay. So we'll um, we'll wait for now to uh, take your cue on that. That sounds good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Next up, um, we've got liquor control board, so we'll do a recess to move into liquor control. I'm wondering if we need to bring more chairs in. Um, we may be expecting a few more people for our 7:45. Well, we're recessing under if um yeah are there any of those folding chairs in the in the uh, yes. yeah yeah i, I think there's two people i'm counting myself for a chair i'm going to chair and then shove that one down yeah. oh. i don't know if it's a special chair you have or <laughs> there you go so While we're waiting on chairs, we'll take a motion to move into liquor control board. So moved. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. So nothing's changed, just the name. Just the name. Motion to Second. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Abstaining? Motion carries. Thank you. Um, would you mind signing right now? I have an election yep, tomorrow. Yeah, we'd be happy so to. So to I can skip out. Oh, your election tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> Motion to approve the minutes of the previous meeting of September 11, 2017. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Anybody opposed? Abstaining? Motion carries. Other business? Is there any other business? Hearing none, I'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Okay, next agenda item is first reading of proposed amendments to land development regulations for stream corridor production. Is this a chip? Yep. Yep. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, one of the things that we mentioned in the earlier presentation uh, on the stormwater utility was um, <coughs> needing to come up with rules to protect stream corridors in the city and actually reestablish them. Stream corridors basically uh, just along a brook like Stevens Brook or Rug Brook or even an intermittent stream. It's what does it look like on the banks alongside and even past the banks. Um, is there any vegetation or is it all impervious? <coughs> As water flows toward that stream, is it going to flow very quickly because it's only flowing over impervious surface and there's nothing to slow it down? Or actually, is there a lot of exposed dirt that's eroding into the brook because of the speed of the water during a storm event? Or is there you know, optimal and um, widely recognized beneficial vegetation around the stream in that corridor that helps to slow storm flows, that helps water to infiltrate before it uh, gets into the brook. And um, 
obviously, you know, the city's pretty built up around this Brooks, and there are development considerations for such a rule. But the Planning Commission um, has been looking at this uh, item. Some of, some of the seeds of this were planted more than a year ago when, when a draft was put forward to the Planning Commission by, actually it was Julie Beth Hines. And we, uh, the Planning Commission held uh, uh, a hearing that went over two meetings and there were actually around three meetings before that when folks were uh, invited to come in and discuss this proposed rule. So it has received some public input and that public input has impacted what is proposed to you tonight. This particular rule is proposed for the land development regulations, so it would be carried out by Dave and permitting and by the Development Review Board and, and uh, so on and so forth. But if you go to uh, where we start numbering the pages for the actual amendments, we state that the intent of this, this proposed rule is to really to prohibit further development right along our brooks that are detrimental to water quality, and over time, to perhaps even reestablish the vegetation along these stream corridors. So if you get down to where we start looking at amendments, proposed amendments, um, to, the, to, the, to the definition of development, we add the removal of vegetation in the riparian buffer area, and we add stream alteration and bank maintenance. Uh, these things are covered in more detail further in the proposal. We add a definition for impervious area. We add a definition for an intermittent stream. <clears throat> we add a definition for a perennial stream, which for our purposes are Grice Brook, Stevens Brook, and Rug Brook. The riparian buffer area, stream alteration and bank maintenance, and the stream corridor area. Uh, you'll see like this section three at the top of, of page three and at the end of the amendment there are lots of places where we insert references to some of these new proposed rules. Not much substantial change there though. But on article three we'll get into the real meat of this proposal. It proposes a new section 523 um, to cover development and other activities in the stream corridor areas. So basically, um, we define the stream corridor area as 30 horizontal feet on either side of the center line of the stream. Elsewhere in the state, and even in the town of St. Albans, uh, they use a definition of 50 feet on either side. We've reduced ours to 30 in recognition of how built out the city is, and that we're gonna, you know, that. That needle we need to thread for water quality here is a little thinner because we need to, you know, to find a way to make this work within our very, very developed city. So we're proposing a stream corridor area of 30 feet on either side of the center line of the stream. The riparian buffer area is within the stream corridor area. And this would be pr pretty much half that width. It's 15 feet on either side of the center line of the stream. So as you'll read this, you'll see the main, uh, the main purpose of the stream corridor area is to limit the creation of any new impervious surface. The main purpose of that riparian buffer area is to start looking at the vegetation to limit the removal of any more vegetation along our brooks to, um, and in some cases, to encourage reestablishment re of vegetation along our brooks. You'll see that item number C on this page, it actually regulates the clearing of trees and vegetation. That if you're going to remove trees that are two inches wider, two inches wider more, when they're about four feet high, about chest high on a person, um, you would need to come in and check with a permitting administrator. And if you wanted to remove any trees that are native and not damaged, you would need a permit before you can do that. Because keeping those trees along our brooks will actually, it will keep the brooks from eroding. In many ways, it protects the property next to the brooks from erosion, but it also helps water quality. Limitations on expansion of impervious, impervious areas and structures. 
So unless you get a waiver, basically it says you cannot expand any new impervious areas or any new structures within that stream corridor area along the brooks. There are a couple exceptions. For instance, for uh, single family and two family residential uses, you could have a small 20 square foot um, impervious, like, like a dog house near the, near the brook, for instance. Um, and under H, if you go forward, we do allow, we have provisions for bridges and boardwalks because every once in a while, you do need to bridge a brook. Um, stabilization and planting required. Basically what this provision does is it says any bare dirt or any impervious areas that are, that are in disrepair and are in danger of eroding have to be stabilized in the stream corridor area. That's to prevent erosion. Um, we have many drainage outfalls along our brooks, and at the top of page four, item G allows for drainage outfalls if given the necessary permits. I've already mentioned item H, which allows for bridges and boardwalks if given the necessary permits. Landscaping in the riparian buffer area. Um, there are a lot of rules that you'll see across the state that say in a riparian buffer area, you're not supposed to mow, you can mow maybe once a year. Um, and you have to plant a lot of vegetation. That idea didn't go over very well with property owners who came to talk to the Planning Commission. Um, our properties are pretty dense in the city. Uh, you know, your single family home along the brook, that area along the brook might be a significant part of your yard. Not being allowed to mow it except for once a year starts to go to the other side from water quality to becoming a, a nuisance. Um, and a major gripe of the city. So what we're proposing for landscaping restrictions in the riparian buffer area, which is basically right along the banks of the stream, is that you can mow it. But try to keep the grass no shorter than, than three inches. Even that much helps the grass slow water down and helps keep that bank in place. And um, landowners under this proposal are, are given until July 30th, 2019 to stabilize those areas in the riparian buffer area and sort of start maintaining a lawn of, of that type. And you're encouraged to plant more if you wish, but uh, this proposal doesn't require you to do full-on riparian you know, vegetation reestablishment that you might find in other rules. However, Jay says that you know, if you were to come before the DRB, for instance, for a full site plan review and the DRB could find cause, to require someone to establish their riparian buffer area, they could so uh, make that condition. And even uh, discontinue impervious areas if there are other places on the property that could assume the function of that impervious area that's right along the stream. Item K also says that the DRB, if they so wish, could um, require you to, either with a fence or with a hedge, to mark where the uh, riparian buffer area is, so it's easier to manage and know, you know, where you're supposed to have that that vegetation and, and uh, where it's not required. L, which is at the bottom of page four and goes to the next page, uh, prevention of stream obstruction, gives the city tools to um, prevent um, whether it's snow, ice, or um, something being stored next to the brook, it, it would prevent those things from becoming possible obstructions in the stream. Um, and then M exempts city infrastructure and city or state permit stormwater management facilities from these rules because they would be following their own water quality rules and standards. Section 524 is for stream alteration and bank maintenance. And the Planning Commission has actually heard for a while now uh, complaints here and there associated with not just our brooks that flow almost all year long, but the intermittent streams, which you probably know, you probably can think of a couple in the city that where you have flowing water during the spring thaw or during um, a large storm event, but they might be dry for the rest of the year. But there's this, you know, the fact of the matter is the things you do to those streams on your land can affect the property adjacent or across the stream from you. And it can affect properties downstream. And the Planning Commission saw a demonstration of, uh, with a water table. We had some folks from the state come in, and they talked about 
various different things you can do to the stream banks on your land, and now it could have a detrimental or a beneficial effect on many other property owners around you. So what we're proposing here is a stream alteration and bank maintenance permit so that as people alter the stream on their land, the potential implications on other properties are taken into account. So the DRV would be able to look at um, the need of the proposed change, whether it reduces the ability of the water course to carry water, whether it would have an adverse impact on downstream or upstream water quality, whether it would, would, would require adjacent or downstream property owners to undertake activities on their land because of what you did on your land, uh, whether it would adversely affect the use and enjoyment of adjacent properties, or whether it would adversely affect habitat value of the water course um, or any wetlands nearby. The, uh, the, uh, the other parts of this section talk about the DRB being able to have access to professional uh, uh, input and uh, con consultation in making these determinations. And um, it also talks about how if a property owner comes before them to alter the stream along their property, we would uh, enhance the notice that, that goes out to adjacent property owners that it would also include people 200 um, feet downstream from, from that property so that everyone who might be affected would get a notice that something's being proposed. It allows for emergency stream alterations, sometimes during a significant storm event when you find that the brook's trying to eat part of your lawn and you do something about it, it wouldn't, you wouldn't be in violation by taking action then and there to protect your property, but it does require you to eventually come before the DRB to have a discussion about <clears throat> what you've done, how much of it can be permanent, and if you have to do anything more for the final solution for that situation. Um, the rest of the proposed amendments all have to do with just making uh, references where they would need to go in other sections of the regulations. Thank you. Questions? So, Chip, I have a question. Um, I can, I, I personally know seven or eight properties along the brook that have retaining walls. Um, I know at least three that are starting, if they haven't collapsed into the brook already, they're on the verge of it. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you can use MS4 money to help them? Because some of these, they, 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 they get, a, I think they have to go before the state to do anything because it is along the brook. Yes. And they just don't have the funds. You're right. There are also state, um, sometimes if you do enough in a brook, you have to go before the state as well. The, the problem with stream channelization and bank armoring is that, um, you know, the state and the feds, they, they don't fund that sort of thing anymore because in the long run, channelization is detrimental to water quality, although it does protect your property. Mm -hmm. So it puts you in a dilemma there. We wouldn't be able to use MS4 money that I'm aware of mm -hmm. to repair a channel, but it doesn't mean it's not possible. Utility, though, right? Yeah, I'm wondering if we could use the funds, because otherwise all that, I mean, to the top part of Upper Weldon, it, it, makes a, it makes a 30 degree turn there, and yeah. it doesn't have a bank, it's just gonna wash basically the next four houses out, and our so, public safety building. So depending on what the design was, if we could design it in a way that helped our MS4 compliance, we absolutely could. Okay. But if it made things worse, we couldn't. Yeah. We, there's already a wall. There's things there's already a wall there. We certainly could take take measures to protect our roadway. Yeah. And we've taken measures before to protect property. Yep. There it might be an opportunity to actually increase water quality. It would probably require more land than just the channel itself, but that is possibly something that a stormwater utility could pay for. Okay, thank you. This was a tough meeting. We have two big items here that we've been grappling with. Um, when I was a boy, I grew up on 34 Barlow Street at my grandmother's house. Um, if anyone doesn't know where that is, it's the house that has the lawn that's almost right beside the brook. Um, Brook was a very, wasn't a very wide brook. But after several years, when I came back home and took a look at it, it was as wide as this room. This was a great piece of work, whoever worked on this in the planning commission. And it must have been hard. 
uh, putting a lot of time on it. To be able to structure something that um, is has to be good for all, but be very careful of the rights you're trampling on, on someone's property, telling them what they can and can't do. Um, there are a couple things in here that, I mean, we're, we're actually going ahead and telling people what they can do and what they can't do with their property. And that always concerns me when we're doing that. Um, and I'm not sure, this is just a first reading, right? Yes. Correct. I, I'm not sure I'm seeing enough protections um, to afford someone the right to appeal something. Um, this reminds me a little bit of the Shoreline Protection Act that was passed in 2014 by the state of Vermont. Mm -hmm. I remember the summer being out there and before July 1st and hearing all kinds of chainsaws um, <laughs> uh, around the lake and all, all around the islands. Yeah. Um, but uh, that, that, that act um, allows somebody to remove things that are dead, diseased, and dangerous. I tell my clients it's the three Ds. Yes. Um, and, and I don't see that in here anywhere. Um, um, and, and I'm kind of of the sort that likes a very neat property. And this kind of smacks against that because you really don't want that here, um, depending on what, you're, what you envision as being neat or not neat. It's tough for people who don't live by a stream to understand uh, the realities of your, your yard when it does border a stream. But um, to make things look nice and to be able to comply with the provisions that are in here might be like the, you know, what's, what's the called the immovable rock and meeting the impervious or the, the impenetrable. The impervious surface. Yeah. The impervious tonight. <laughs> so um, I'm not sure there's enough of that here, although this is a very good piece of work. This is a very good piece of work. You might, um, yeah, so it, it, it's not apparent, um, but the way we envision that is, um, First of all, any this is a reg, this would go through a regular permitting process. So if, if Dave if Dave makes a decision in the permitting office, it's appealable to the DRB. If it's a DRB decision, it's appealable to the environmental court, just like any other permitting decision. Um, but it's too bad to have to force someone to have to, to go to those extremes and to that for that amount of money to to use those avenues. When I think we can do more within this, a little more within this for that type of protection. I, I find it hard that I have to have someone 200 feet downstream from me give me the authority to do something on my property that I want to do to improve my property. Um, and the other thing too is, I, I agree with you Chad, there are people that can't afford to do some of this stuff that needs to be done. Um, and, all, and all they want to do is make their lawn look nice or they want to make it so that their lawn doesn't fade away into the brook and I'm just wondering, um, how, do, how are we going to help those people? I, I'm not seeing that here anywhere. Uh, so this is the first reading, and I, I really like this. Um, and, but I, I think there's a couple more things we need to be thinking about. We, we did uh, spend quite a bit of time on, like, what is a damaged tree? Tree splits in half. It's still alive. It's still sending out new shoes. Can you cut it down? It's not going to heal itself. It's not going to you know, yeah. be restored. And what's a dead tree? It, a dead tree, we sort of like, it's a log that isn't attached to anything, it's just a dead log. We had to sort of, you know, and then, you know, is it dead if it has the roof all attached, like that willow tree that fell on North Main Street, you know? If that fell into the brook, can you leave it? Can you cut it up? Root ball is still attached. You know, it's still in the ground partially. Boy. And, and we're telling people to go out with what, a caliper now? Uh, and, and put it on the, the tree to see if it matches the, the, the two inches or not. It's, it's, it's technical for what I would want the average homeowner to have to pay attention to. It was, yeah, originally you know? it was just you couldn't cut down any trees unless you spoke to Dave, but then um, people started talking about, well, what's a tree? Could it be a small whip. sapling, a whip it? Yeah. You know? yeah. So that's why, that's actually why we went to the two inch caliper, because otherwise it would be, you couldn't pull anything, because it might be a tree. Mm -hmm. But we'll, we'll look at that. And, we and one more thing I'd like for the next time we take a look at this, is I'd like to see a map of the corridor. Mm -hmm. I'd like to see exactly what properties, what swath of the city we're talking about here. Um, just so that we can, have in our minds who this is affecting and make sure that they have plenty of opportunity. These are things that can interfere with the, 
with the purchase and sale of properties um, as well. And so I think everyone needs to know who's involved. It was funny, when I was reading this, I said, wow, I mean, I can remember this in 2007 coming up when I was on one, uh, one of the other boards. And then I said, wow, this is really good. And I said, geez, my property in this? <laughs> <laughs> and so I had to think about it, you know, and, and I said, well, you know, other people are my thinking that too. So I was looking for a map, you know, to see, you know, but we didn't, we didn't have that. I don't know if we have one around, but it probably, we probably should get a copy of it so we can see what's going on. Well, we can do that. Yeah. Jim, could you remind us of um, the process that um, has gotten us to, to the first reading, um, the public engagement with Planning Commission and, and so on? The so last year, uh, we uh, received a municipal planning grant with the town to engage some consultants in drafting some, uh, many of the regulations that we are going to have to adopt as part of our MS4 permit for stormwater and water quality. This was one of them and received a lot of good expertise and reflected uh, what's been used in other communities. And it went before the Planning Commission at least twice back then. And then it went on the back burner while we worked on the city plan. And then, uh, well, when the Planning Commission held an on-site meeting in the Barlow and Upper Welland Street neighborhood, which is impacted by Stevens and Bryce Brooks, I believe, um, in that general area, you know, this, this came up again, and we, we received a lot of good uh, neighbor input then. I think that was in August or July, sometime in the summer. We did a walk of the neighborhood, and we looked at many different backyards that are up against the stream and thought, and, and many different types of situations, too. And so that was a good background for the Planning Commission on what, you know, the property owners are dealing with along the stream and how these potential rules could impact them. So we kept... No, those folks in the know uh, sent them out emails and basically the Planning Commission met upon this uh, every subsequent meeting after that anyway. And so we had pro some property owners that came in and kept following along the process. So the Planning Commission met, I'd say, five times in, er in total on this specific, um, uh, uh, this specific proposal. Two of, those, two of those meetings were in official hearing status, but they were taking public input the entire way. And that's on top of the um, meetings we held way back last year when it was first proposed. It went, underwent a rewrite, and uh, a lot of that having to do with the public input we received from, from folks who live along the streams on how this might impact them. Thanks. Um, this is a uh, first reading um, at this point. Um, seek any uh, public comment? <laughs> yes, and um, because we have a large audience, <laughs> I'm going to ask you to identify yourself. Right. I'm Barbara Weinstein. Uh, I don't know if it can be easily remedied, but there may be an issue with one of the de definitions. When you measured your stream corridor from the center of the stream, your teeny tiny streams have the most stream corridor protection, and your larger streams have less stream corridor protection. I don't know if it can be remedied. Can I speak to that? Yeah. Uh, that's one of the things we rewrote. We actually started out with a very complicated uh, definition of stream corridor that you would use if you got someone from the state to come and look mm -hmm. at your stream and say, all right, here's the top of slope, and here's the top of bank. And, we were trying to explain it to the Planning Commission and to the folks in the audience, and um, the feedback that we got is that at least to start with these rules the first mm -hmm. time, if they're adopted, we have to go with something simple. And as the community develops more expertise, perhaps we could go to something that's more key to top of slope and top of bank, but uh, like, like you, like what you're describing. So it is... Um, it is a simpler definition of the corridor, but based on the input the Planning Commission received, you know, simplicity is what people wanted for this. I understand it, I concur. Yep. And we, we did chop it from 50 foot, which is the state sort of down to 30, recognizing that it's a heavily built up corridor right running through the city. So 50 would be right to people's back porches. They wouldn't have any yard above. Okay, thank you. And um, yes, uh, one, two, three. Uh, Tom told us, um, I, I maybe I missed it. I'm just curious what comply, level of compliance non like residential property owners have would have with this. I, I know there's some entities that are along the stream that are very close to the stream <coughs> that are not doing much to um, preserve the banks, and uh, I'm just curious if they have any 
of compliance also. Um, you're asking, could people, could people run into trouble with this new rule? No, I mean, uh, you know, as, as an individual property or resident of the town, it sounds if mm -hmm. I was on a stream, I understand yeah. that I'd have responsibility to follow this, but if there are um, other organizations, businesses, other entities within the city that also fall on the stream, do they, are they required to follow this as well, or do they, are they exempt from that? Uh, no, all, all properties okay. would be, you know, if you, had, if you had a parking lot right up to the stream under these rules, you'd be able to keep it as long as your parking lot wasn't falling apart and little pieces of asphalt were falling into the brook all the time. Um, if you have, you know, we, for that, for that, um, the task of reestablishing that we have, that requirement to look into, that's, we did look at, you know, areas where there is vegetation along the stream, that's good, and that's the window where we're like, okay, so, for that existing vegetation, don't mow it so that it gets lower than three inches, for instance. And, and so that's that, that's that requirement. But if you have a shed right in the stream, cor stream corridor, or even in the existing riparian buffer area, and this rule is adopted, you'll be able to keep that shed. Um, so that sort of thing would be grandfathered. You just couldn't add another one. Great. Thanks. OK, um, Chris and then Jeff. And I'll ask you to state your full name. Did you, Chris, did you have a? No, okay. yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought I saw your name. OK. Jeff. Jeff Bean. Uh, this MS4 requirement, obviously, is putting the community somewhat in a bind to become, or let's say, become in compliance. Um, obviously, it's a community concern. But the way that I'm reading, the way that this ordinance is proposed, is putting the burden purely on the property owners along this river, these river courses. Um, it's putting it on in many ways, and I don't know if necessarily what's being proposed is going to be the remedy. Um, it's unfairly putting uh, restrictions depending on what level of improvements have occurred on the property, or in other words, existing use. So you've got a parking lot, and then next to it, they can't mow the lawn. And that's a situation where this is not fair for that adjoining property owner to say, well, geez, <laughs> really? And, and that's, that, that situation is <coughs> primarily because of the existing use and we're in a city environment. Uh, the negative effect of property values for these properties, for example, Tim, I believe you mentioned something about wanting to see a map. I didn't put a map together of my property, my property, <coughs> property who I'm here basically of concern with, where over 35% of this property now falls under that restriction. So anything that comes under, like say, a property, a, a land trust, you lose use of that property. You lose value of that property. If you look at anything that's on uh, subsidized housing or like Champlain Housing Trust, those type of properties are not sold at the same value of a normal property because there, there's restricted use of that land. In this particular case, that's exactly what's happening. It would be restricted use of that land from that point on. And to say, well, okay, you, you can get, yeah, you can, can mow it and so on, but it has to be three inches. Again, you're putting extra uh, stipulations on one property owner that the next one doesn't have to. There's, uh, also, the how this is going to be administered. You also you said the uh, zoning office is going to take care of it. Uh, who's going to remove all the debris that's currently in these brooks? Shopping carts, bicycles, uh, trees that have fallen into the brook that are now causing restrictions in there. And to allow that to grow in, if you, I've got mapping for 40 years and I've seen river courses, especially low-lying flat areas along like would be around Oak, Spruce, and that area, those areas are going to become flood zones because of this additional growth. It needs to be kept clear to protect these properties. So that's something that needs to be taken into consideration. If we're not taking care of the property there, what's going to happen? Mosquitoes and rodents and other things are going to start coming into play. We have issues with drug infestation from nearby apartment houses using that brook corridor that we need to flush out. If you give them more shade and more cover, the mattress is only going to get worse in our particular area. So maybe on the upper well end around Barlow, that's a whole different scenario than down on the other part of town where we need to maintain our properties just to keep it 
taken care of, uh, opposed to letting it go. And that's the appearance that we might end up going to by not taking care of the property that we have. Uh, these other drainage outfalls that are currently going into the brook, including, like, say, the Food City parking lot and all that, that's from an old railroad site. There's other reasons uh, that MS4 comes into play here. The soil, the uh, stream bank erosion is obviously one protection that the city has to look at. Uh, so any type of activity around there obviously needs to be controlled. And I believe that's where this ordinance should be looking at is to make certain that that bank is being protected. Uh, however, I think it goes a little far fetched even with this 30 foot, and I don't care if the town's 50 foot, that's a very rural setting that opposed to the, the city. And uh, I believe it's putting an unworthy due burden on certain property owners. I'm sort of curious what other steps and measures that the city's taken to come into compliance with MS4. I've seen some on the program tonight, but what other impact other than this impervious area um, are, is going to be imposed on other property owners other than the ones that happen to own property around these brooks? Okay, thank you. Um, any other public comments? Okay, I'm seeing none. Uh, just suggestion. Yes. Is there, um, is there any way that we could, after you've heard the things today, Chip, or the responses that you're going to receive, um, as a result of uh, the, the meeting tonight, could we continue this as a first reading yeah. rather than move to a second reading uh, for the next meeting? I do you think that's a smart thing to do? Or I, I, know, I, I know this is hot, you're hot on it, and you, we should be, um, but given the, the, all the things that are going on, do you think we should hold it off a little bit? One more time, maybe? Yes, okay. sounds like that's I, the yes. <laughs> this, is yes, all, this is a lot to digest, and I, um, I think that would be helpful. So we'll ask, uh, what do we do? Another recess, the yeah. recess. recess the first read. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, that, just, because, just because of the issue alone, which we've talked about extensively, uh, the planning commission, between the grass lawn right next to the paved parking lot, both on the edge of the street, there is this issue. And, the idea is to adopt this, which is to get something on the books and then go back eventually, you know, 10 years from now, you know, when the parking lot will perhaps be required to put a buffer, you know, take up some of the asphalt and plant a buffer, but not initially with the ordinance. Do we do a motion to recess or do we just recess? Okay, so do you yeah. recess this? Yeah. Great. Okay, shoot. Got it all the way, Dave. Okay, next up is uh, agenda item number eight, presentation of the Taylor Park Master Plan. Um, uh, Tom, you're presenting? Yep. Yes, I am. And anybody joining you? Yes, I have Jeff uh, Hodgson and Anna Luke from Wagner Hodgson Landscape Park. And while these guys are something, I'll, I'll, I'll begin by giving you a little background okay. um, on our process of work. Do you need to set things up computer-wise? Yes. Yeah, chips on. We have Tom Polis, I'm chair of the Parks Commission and the Taylor Park Master Plan Committee. Um, we began, we formed uh, beginning in February 2017 <laughs> with the following charge from the council to maintain an inclusive process that welcomes and integrates a broad range of public input, to engage in a forward-looking project that formulates ambitious and shares short and long-term visions for the park, to balance the following goals, increase Taylor Park's capacity to accommodate events and other activities that contribute to the economic vitality of the city, to maintain the park's ability to host and perhaps expand current activities and uses, and to improve the park's built infrastructure and natural environment. Also to provide the city with well thought out plans that will guide coordinated improvements to the park, both large and small in scale. Um, the community is made up of uh, individuals from at least 13 different groups and stakeholders in the park in the city. Uh, our eight different meetings had almost uh, an average of 14 people per meeting, so we had really good participation, really strong input 
Uh, we started out with one of our deliverables to identify the current uses of the park, which are extensive. I believe that park is very well used and very well appreciated, um, both by the community and the members of the, this committee. Um, we then began to list all desired new uses, current uses, which everything was on the table. Every possible idea, including the current pieces, were there. And we began to whittle it down from there based on the input from the various um, individuals um, who attended meetings um, and conversations with the public. Um, we then got to the point uh, where we, as part of that, bringing on Wagner Hodgson as our uh, um, consultants to kind of guide us in that process and laying it down and kind of taking our ideas and trying to put them into something that we could visualize. Um, as part of our deliverables, we, we, those are a few that I mentioned, um, and then we ended up with um, actual concepts that we decided to um, move forward with to bring to the council's attention prior to getting into more in-depth engineering and cost analysis, et cetera, um, to make sure we had a plan that was heading in the direction the council wanted to move in uh, before we spent that time kind of maybe possibly going in the wrong direction or, you know, um, make sure we're doing what we need to do. Thanks. All right. Great. Well, I'm Jeff Hodson from Wagner Hodson Landscape Architecture and Hannah Luke from our office is here as well. And uh, I have to say, when we first started working with the committee, or when we first uh, were hired, and I found out there was a committee of 20 plus people, we were a little nervous about how we would ever make decisions and move forward. But the committee's been amazing, and you have a really dedicated uh, group of volunteers working on this. Um, I'd like to go over kind of a, I mean, Tom kind of started describing it, but kind of the process we've gone through briefly and then get to the plan as a result. And we also have boards in case anything becomes uh, too hard to read on the screen. Um, we started out the process by really getting to know Taylor Park uh, much better um, visiting it during uh, weekdays and weekends, farmers markets, the Maple Festival, to really kind of get a, a really strong sense of all the events that happen at, at Taylor Park and, um, and just the, the way it's used throughout the week. Uh, next, we started looking at you know, the physical constraints and physical opportunities. We did a, a site analysis that looked at uh, what are the existing conditions. We knew that there were a lot of stormwater issues from all the pavement to the east coming down into the park, that uh, some of the permeable pavement had, had challenges and, and failed in places. Um, and so we really wanted to understand the stormwater impact on the park and also the circulation through the park and how people access the park. And of course, we wanted to learn more about the uh, history of the park. And we're really surprised. I, we were both familiar with the Ladies' Fountain, but we didn't know how the fountain had changed. And the context of the fountain had changed over the years. And we found these uh, old postcards on eBay, and uh, they were very helpful. And if you go back, the, the one thing, you know, the majestic trees that once lined the central uh, walkway of the park were pretty impressive. And there were also these things that had disappeared over the years, like the bridge that went over the reflecting pond and the old uh, fountains. And then we looked uh, in detail at the current condition of the park and how it's being used and what are the maintenance challenges, uh, what are the different pavement types in the, in the park, and how does the park interact with its context and surrounding streetscape? And really looked at kind of every element of the park, the condition of some of the monuments, the Civil War monument, um, trees, all sorts of aspects. And then, uh, as Tom mentioned, the committee had started this matrix of existing and possible uses for the park. And it was really interesting to discuss each one of these in kind of depth and talk about you know, the pros and cons of potential ideas, you know, 
things as far-fetched as an ice rink. Um, all sorts of things were on the table for discussion, and I think it was a really good process for the group um, to kind of come together and say, well, wow, I think it'd be great to have this. Is this the best place for it? Or um, would that really be the best use of the park? Um, uh, because the park space, it's a very large park for an urban park, but it, it's not unlimited. So, and there's also quite a bit of grade change, which makes some of the things more challenging. And what we kind of um, came to as a result were kind of these um, kind of uh, goals and kind of uh, framework for moving forward with the, the design of the park, the master plan. Obviously, respecting the history of the park and the setting for the amazing fountain that's there, uh, improving connectivity through the park and how people move through the park and access the park. And then we also talked about how Church Street has these amazing historic buildings on it, but it feels very separate from the park um, due to both topography and also just lack of a way to kind of get from the west up to the east uh, to these buildings. And uh, we also talked about Church Street itself. Uh, right now when there's festivals, Main Street gets partially shut down. Can Church Street be uh, reimagined as a kind of pedestrian zone where food trucks and um, things could happen when there's a festival in the park? Um, and just thinking about how Church Street can interact with the park more. Uh, creating an interactive water feature. The, the ladies fountain is very popular with kids, but maybe it's not the best place for them to be climbing through. The water's not uh, treated, and it's not a, a modern kind of uh, interactive fountain that for kids to be kind of splashing around in it. So do we introduce something that will draw the kids uh, away from the basin of the ladies and give them their own kind of uh, fun feature in the park? And a, a big part of the goals we came up with were, you know, the north end has the ladies fountain, has the formal kind of alley, but the south end doesn't really have a, a strong identity of its own right now. So we talked about, you know, what is the south end, what could it become uh, in the master plan? And then um, performances. There was a lot of discussion about how much should the park uh, have infrastructure for performances. Um, versus kind of uh, the way it's done now where a stage is brought in and set up for a festival. So. <laughs> um, and uh, accommodating both the current and future uses of the park. Um, improving or relocating the current band shell. Um, touching and diverting the stormwater that comes down from Church Street. There's no curb on Church Street right now, so the water basically flows uh, downhill into the park. Uh, providing, uh, or creating spaces for weddings, for events, for photography after weddings. Somebody wants to have their photograph taken with the ladies in the background. Where's a good spot for, for that to happen? And creating um, more seating options rather than just benches or their informal places to sit. We saw a lot of people sitting on the Civil War monument um, you know, providing places to eat your lunch, cafe tables, movable furniture potentially, uh, and then improving the condition of the Civil War Memorial. We understood that um, over the years water had gotten in and there were some challenges with the, maintaining the, the actual monument. And could it be uh, improved and combined with a performance space? That was one, one thing we looked at. And then really highlighting all the monuments in the park. And um, lastly, uh, accommodating the seasonal portalettes, but talking about a longer term solution for the need for bathrooms. And that's something that every town is, is kind of struggling with. So as a result, um, so this is the existing park. And we rendered it similar to our, our different alternatives, just so we could kind of see it in the same light. Uh, 
The most of the paths in the center of the park are asphalt right now. We talked about introducing other materials, giving kind of a hierarchy to the circulation through the park, different types of pavement. Uh, and you can kind of see in this in this current plan that the east-west sidewalks don't quite align with the mid-block crossing on Main Street. They don't quite align with the courthouse. So you kind of have to zigzag your way to get up through the park. Um, so we looked at three quick options just to get the committee uh, reacting to different things. Uh, the first one uh, we looked at uh, really just kind of refine the north end, put in some special paving. We thought uh, it might be fun to reintroduce the historic bridge that went over the water basin. You know, maybe now it's a depressed uh, kind of a flower garden and the bridge could go over it, um, giving you a different view of the, the park. We aligned a central walkway that goes from the mid-block crossing uh, up to the courthouse where that meets the central axis of the park. We located a children's play fountain with uh, tables and chairs around it. And then we took the Civil War Memorial and we said, well, if we're gonna rebuild it in the future, what if it shifts to the center of the park? And you know, what if there became a performance space on the backside of it that took advantage of the, the topography of the site and you could have terrace seating that, that went up the hill. Disadvantage, afternoon sun is in the eyes of uh, people watching a performance. Um, and then the south end of the park, in this one, we uh, proposed a small uh, gazebo band shell um, and then really looked at that south end as having its own circulation pattern in the form of this oval walkway. The second concept, uh, we looked at combining the south two-thirds of the park uh, with this formal oval that we felt was really sympathetic to the kind of historical uh, feel of the park. Uh, and we, we looked at introducing a large band shell, um, potentially in the same uh, architectural character of the fountain. Maybe it has iron and it's kind of in a material way, the counterbalance in the south end to the ladies' fountain and the water basin. Oh, and before we, oh, no, go ahead. That's fine. Uh, and then the third scheme, we looked at extending the central double walkway all the way through the park um, to a uh, interactive fountain at the south end, and then beyond that, more of a um, traditional uh, performance stage structure that could accommodate larger concerts and, and events. And this scheme also looked at realigning the sidewalk along Main Street to kind of uh, have a curve to it so that instead of right now where you parallel Main Street and then you hit the adjoining streets and have to jog down, um, this would kind of direct pedestrians down to that, that crosswalk location and kind of have a central plaza opposite the mid-block uh, Main Street crossing. Um, and then, uh, like we often do, people like different things of different schemes. And we came up with the current plan, which is has a, features from pretty much all three schemes. And we worked closely with the committee to uh, refine this. Um, basically, uh, one thing I haven't really addressed, the different schemes looked at Church Street as um, having varying degrees of ability to close it down for festivals. We finally, as the committee agreed, we decided that maybe it wasn't the whole length, it was um, just the portion opposite the, the large oval. Um, the committee f seemed to feel that uh, for performances, if you really want to have uh, a good performance, a band shell might not be sufficient, so they opted to head toward a more, um, more of a true performance space um, for acoustics and for 
orientation this way, the uh, crowd uh, really isn't having the setting sun in their eyes. It, it worked well for um, performances as far as solar orientation. Um, wants to uh, take on any aspect of what's shown in the master plan, it would have to go through its own public final design process. The walkways, maybe not so much. If we decide we want to follow some of the new orientations on the map, it would be a matter of, you know, what are they made out of, concrete, asphalt, whatever else might exist. Some of the other aspects of the plan, such as um, the performance space, uh, right now, what the consultants are showing us is a basic footprint of where it could be and some of the uh, amenities identified to go around it on how it would all work, but what that performance space stage actually looks like, um, sound, lighting, what else would go with it, that would all have to be part of a future planning process. So where we are right now with uh, this master planning process is the Final deliverable from the consultants will include a master plan with some visuals and illustrations, some cost estimates, ballpark, because this is a conceptual plan, and then some suggestions for phasing and prioritization. But then the city will have to take that and the city will have to make its own decisions about what it does next. What we decided to do was to, uh, after the, you know, we've been meeting on this since February, and after all the public input and the vote of the Parks Commission last week, we decided to take this plan before the council and for the council's input and potentially its blessing. At such point that the council decides that it, was, it decides to approve a certain master plan and we'd, know, we'd see then what's on there, that's when the consultants would go into the estimates and phasing so that they would be spending that time on what the council wants in the final master plan. I would suggest that if the council approves the master plan, they, they approve something for the whole park, that we see everything, um, the sort of the basic direction we'd like to go for the entire park, and we can see it, how everything interacts with everything else. Um, this project is funded primarily, uh, with the majority with a grant from the state. Um, you know, if the city wants to pursue anything they see in this master plan, we'd have to, you know, we wouldn't be able to do it until we can find the funding to do it. Um, many of the improvements in the park would be tiffable, uh, be able to be funded with through tax increment financing. Thank you. Okay, um, I, I know uh, that many of you are here tonight uh, to uh, provide comments on uh, this plan. So what I'd like to do is open up for public comment um, as with the council's agreement and then um, come back to the council um, after that point for further um, questions and comment. And I'd just like to say this is one of the larger crowds that we've had um, in a long time and I think it reflects how much we all care about this park um, as um, such a tremendous um, treasure and asset within this community. So I thank you all for um, the participation that you've had to this point and if you're new to the conversation, welcome. We're eager to hear public feedback and also um, remind everybody that we're here because we love this community and folks that are here and have been part of the process are here with good intentions. So we look forward to hearing from you and um, with that I will move to public comment. Um, yep. I'll ask you again to, um, if you're commenting, indicate your name uh, for the record and uh, we'll circulate uh, through the audience. Mr. Hermity. Well, first of all, thank everyone in the community for doing the work you do, okay? Uh, I think we are an example for Washington, D.C. So thank <laughs> you very much for this. Uh, I had a dinner with my neighbor who's 94, and I happened to bring up this conversation. And I'm going to start with her because she says, I really like it open. Um, but then her next thing she went to very quickly is, can I afford it? Okay. Uh, I came out real loud and clear. Um, she would like the idea of it being a park, not a playground. Um, she liked the fact it was open. And she's lived in the community for 94 years, so I think that's worth those thoughts. My personal thoughts, um, I'm very concerned, and I talked to Chip earlier today about this, is the performance area on the south end. Um, I don't like the idea of an enclosed one. 
I have a question about noise. As I get older, I'm having harder and harder time to hear. And that's on the noisiest corner. So I understand the need for public venues, but I'm saying, hmm, okay. Um, let's see. Visibility in the park, I think, to me, helps with security of the park. So I think that's a big aha. Um, maintenance. Anything we're doing, I remember when we rebuilt Hard Act many years ago, and we didn't take into account maintenance. That was a big mistake on our part, and it was almost a death knell for Hard Act then. Um, thank you. Great, thank you. Other comments? Um, Barbara, you had okay. raised your hand? Yeah, I've got some remarks. Um, the city is on a wonderful <laughs> upward trajectory of renewal and rejuvenation. And part of this process is planning for the Taylor Park of the future while preserving its beloved historical character and traditions. I think the Wagner Hodgson plan accomplishes this goal. It's a vision for the future that is built on the shoulders of giants, some of whom the music and horticultural communities have concerns. I've been wrestling with the issues raised by these communities at Tuesday's meeting, and I have four suggestions for addressing these issues. I must emphasize that I am speaking as a citizen and not as a commissioner because these were last minute concerns that just came up on Tuesday. My uh, four suggestions, the first, Acknowledging, as a city, we should acknowledge the vital contributions to the functioning of Taylor Park and its traditions of live music and horticultural beauty. I was blown away on Tuesday to learn of the 17 years of effort needed to create the Loomis Bandstand and the immense effort behind the creation of the English Perennial Garden. Uh, number two, honoring. We need to recognize the Loomis Group and the St. Albans Garden Club and Master Gardeners through such actions as certificates of appreciation, proclamations, and or naming celebrations of features inspired by these groups. For example, the new Loomis bandstand or performance space, the new Garden Club Garden, and this if, as, and when they are ever built. Number three, archiving. I'm so glad Alex is here. <laughs> um, a permanent record of music and horticulture, images and stories could be created with the assistance of our museum and the involved groups. For example, a website, an armchair history show, and or an exhibit. And number four, repurposing. If as and when new features in the park space replace existing ones, every effort should be made to reuse the originals in other public spaces. As a commission, we are already discussing the need for an open-sided pavilion in Houghton Park. Another public space may well need a horticultural work of art as a focal point. In conclusion, these two groups help establish the culture of music and horticulture in the park. As St. Albans grows, the needs of the community are outgrowing the existing features, while the values they represent really define who we are. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments? Yes. Yes, Anne. Anne Levy. Um, I've lived in St. Albans now almost half a century. I may, I, I, may I ask you to stand um, sure. just so that we can all And see. so in the time I've lived here, there have been lots of plans for the park. And I guess I was a little surprised to see, to learn 
through the news media that there was a master plan being developed because I walked through the park between three and five times a week in any weather and all, any time of day. And it's never looked as good as it does now. And I understand there are some issues. Lighting would be, you know, there would be, better lighting would be a plus. Um, I know what they're talking about with the Bank Street water issue. We have it on Congress Street also. The problem is when the sidewalks were put in, they didn't really put curbs. So runoff that can't go down the storm sewers because they have leaves over the top come down the sidewalk. These are things that can be fixed. Um, you know, years ago there was talk about having a kiddie pool and a kiddie this, that, and the other. And the discussion, the consensus was this is St. Albans front parlor, not their family room. <laughs> um, it's a beautiful, elegant space. It, can accommodate and is at present accommodating a lot of things. The farmer's market, I think, works very well the way it is. There's plenty of room for more vendors because there are more streets um, or more alleys or whatever. Um, uh, I know that a lot of trees have been taken down for whatever reason. Maybe they need to be replaced. Uh, I think a concert venue the Luna Shell is wonderful, the Citizens Band and the concerts that are there are wonderful, but to think of a more elaborate space, I think um, is going to detract from the, the feeling of a park, and it's going to be odd, and you have the issue of downtown traffic. Um, not all concerts can be held in Taylor Park. Uh, a flautist would have a hard time. And I don't, I just, I think it's misplaced. Um, to have a green space where you know people walk, enjoy, um, sit, there, there used to be more benches, maybe more benches, maybe a little chess table, you know, and checkerboards. I and mean, there are various small things that can be done. But it seems to me we're going to be throwing away the essence of the park when we bring all these new things that maybe aren't necessary. And we've, the Gardens Pub has done such a fab, fabulous, or the Master Gardens Pub, all whatever you call yourself, whoever you are, right? I mean, all of that is wonderful, and the plantings along Church Street, and I guess I don't, I don't see a lot of the things that were um, labeled problems as being problems, that a street doesn't line up with an alley. Well, you know, it, well, I, don't, I don't see this huge, huge makeover. I don't see the next Thank you. Okay, um, I think it's uh, Sue in the back. Yes. Yeah, um, I think so Anne expressed. Would you would you also stand so we can see you? Anne? I'm Sue Prince. Um, I think Anne did a great job expressing what I think feel. Also, I'll just add a couple of things. Um, first of all, I think the bandstand is lovely and appropriate. We have a a, a, a large park for a, a small city, but it's not that large. It is. Uh, very well occupied at the present. I think the gardens have done it, are incredible, and, and it's taken years to establish them to the extent that they are established. And you know, they are glorious, and everybody who comes to visit us uh, remarks on that. Um, I don't think that we have a bandstand that's very nice and in good repair. It could be you could improve it. You could make uh, make put some wrought iron on it or do something like that if you wanted to make it more complementary to the, the fountain. That would be great. Uh, but we, but uh, I don't see that we need a band shelter. I agree with what Anne was saying about the issues possibly with it. But also, that end of the park, I mean, already I think the Civil War uh, Memorial uh, was a very generous thing to do and everything, but it kind of overpowers 
that end of the park, and it, it actually looks like it's it's a uh, a band shell. You know, I think that this is it's going to start getting too heavy at that end of the park, and I just don't think it would be appropriate. I love. The, I think the master plan was beautiful. I love the idea of the oval. I think it, it, it did a lovely job of planning all this, and we certainly need improvements to the surfaces of the walkways. And I think all this could be discussed, but I really think, I really don't like the band show. <laughs> uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, OK, other comments? Yes. Uh, oh. Okay. Um, I did speak briefly earlier. David Barber, I'm the chair of the Planning Commission. Um, it, could we just go back to the slide where you showed the, the large pictures of the proposed band shell, uh, possible band shell? Okay, so these here. Um, uh, my, my concerns, again, um, we, we just finished uh, quite a large. Uh, would you, could we just a point of clarification? Would you identify whether you're speaking for the planning commission or are you no, speaking for yourself I, as a citizen? I'm speaking as an individual citizen because it hasn't come before the planning commission. Okay, okay. we did work in the field of it, so we to take to do the uh, stormwater and um, street corridor rules. So Thank you. this has not come for uh, you know official hearing before the planning commission. Another concern, but I'll put that on the back burner. But, um, I did, I did hand out some of these, and this image here, I handed out to the uh, city councilors and also to the um, commissioners, the parks and commissioners. This image here is of the lovely band shell historic in Bristol, Vermont. It's just idyllic. It's picture perfect. In fact, on the day I took this picture, other people were there looking at it. I don't care, they're also taking pictures. I think they had their phones, but you know, who knows? Um, and then the other one is just another historic image that they didn't show you um, of the fountain with lovely little flowers bordering the, the gravel paths and uh, flowers all around the base of the fountain and flowering trees, of course. Um, but I, I just want to say, uh, I did previously work um, uh, for nine years for the Burlington Department of Parks and Recreation. And in those nine years, I was um, a park attendant, a gate attendant, I was a waterfront supervisor, I was a, a North Beach supervisor, I was a boathouse dock master. I did many of the jobs in the parks. And I will tell you, um, it, I, the main concern with this plan that I have is, again, we just had a lengthy uh, presentation on, on stormwater, MS4, coming up, is the increase in um, you know, hard surface. You have, you have added a large plaza and a building here, a lot of hard surface. The walkway, the main walkway is widened according to the, and the another plaza here, plazas on all the corners, plus the installation of this new oval walkway. It's a, it's a lot of hard surface you're adding to this park, a lot. Um, and it's also the elevation change. Um, from, from the bird's eye view, it looks great, but if you were to do a cross section, um, the architect mentioned that there is quite an elevation change, and when I went to the uh, park, Parks and Recreation meeting, uh, I believe Jeff mentioned, Jeff Young mentioned that it is 13 feet of elevation change from Church Street to Main Street. I didn't see this yet. Uh, well, I mean, yeah. you see these lines of elevation, topography, so if, you, if they're, each one equals a foot, or I don't know which one equals, but, um, but so you would be digging in to create a level area here and having a retaining wall of three, three steps or so, and then again building up and having another retaining sort of three steps, three or four steps here. So, um, but again, um, you know, again, nine years of growing from Parks and Rec, and when we had events at Waterford Park, they would set up a tent, people would bring their lawn chairs in, they would listen to a concert. And if you look at the example of Shelburne Farms and Olmsted, Frederick Law Olmsted Design Space, Frederick Law Olmsted, the great Frederick Law Olmsted, the landscape architect, or bar none, Central Park, you know, Prospect Park in Brooklyn. They, they have the Mozart Festival there in, in uh, Sherman Farms. And again, people don't need a hard surface plaza to come and listen to the, the music. They set up the tent, it's temporary. People bring their own lawn chairs and they set up. They listen to the wonderful music, <clears throat> pick up their lawn chair, and they go home. And again, to, to have you know, such a large pavilion with such hard space, plaza in front of it, um, and you know, it's not just being used for
for concerts, it's, it's what about the rest of the year? In February, I guarantee you, you're not going to get your, your value, your use out of that in, in the winter months. So it's two months, January, February. You know, I, I just, that, that was the main concern. And then other issues were brought up at the Parks and Rec meet, meeting. Um, I had no history, uh, idea of the history point behind the round garden there that went back until the 1940s originally established and they just totally you know uh, reconstructed it it's, it is magnificent and that would be lost to a splash pad in, in this proposal um, you know I, I just I agree with your uh, comments of the other woman that it, the lady that it, it is it seems a little heavy-handed um, treatment of the park and there are many things could be upgraded in particular um, the walkways which are asphalt, you know, those have to be changed in any master plan. It has to be changed either concrete, gravel, or something, but not asphalt. Um, they're just, just, you know, they're really driving down the park. Um, but the park has never looked better, and I'm just concerned that if, what, what is the rush? You know, can we get this right? We have one shot to really get this right. We spent a year and a half on the city plan. We spent, you know, a year and a half on the housing plan. We spent a year and a half on, on um, the Stebbins, Margaret Catherine, you know, revitalization. You know, as a planning commission, six months on the, the, the uh, just just the corridor for the street corridor. You know, I'm just a little concerned that this is being fast tracked, and I, I don't understand the reasoning behind it. I, you know, quite frankly. Okay. You know, thank so, you. Uh, thank you. Okay, Ryan, you're. Yeah, uh, I'm Ryan Doyle. Stand I'm gonna please. sit because I've been dancing all weekend. Well, it actually, it helps us to to see. I don't know if everyone can see. Can I see you loud enough for you guys? Is that better? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Carry on. Um, so, uh, I, in the five years that I went to two universities, I watched two quads get redesigned, a waterfront park, and a student center. It's probably why it was so expensive to go to college for so long. But um, I want to start with some of the things that are really nice about this plan that make a lot of sense. And like really simple things like cutting corners, right? People don't walk like marching Soviet troops. Like, corners need to be cut out. We don't need right angles. Um, things like putting in a sidewalk along Church Street, right? Not only is it a matter for curbing, but when people exit their vehicle, that they're exiting onto a solid surface that isn't pitched already, right? Like, those things are okay in rural areas, but we have lots of, of people parking there. Um, I have seen somebody fall coming out of their car there trying to walk down between the gardens, um, instead of going into the street and making their way to one of the, the actual entry points. So things like that are, are really important. Um, having a curved walkway that, that bends and kind of flows towards the front, and that, to me, makes a much bigger difference in making a sense of connectivity to two different nodes, um, even though we are trying to make some space between the utility sidewalk uh, along Main Street and actual flow in the park. Uh, that being said, I know people um, sometimes complain about the amount of, of surface area that's uh, impermeable. Um, but a perimeter sidewalk, a really nice sidewalk, should have a lot of breadth and space to them. Right? If we want people to take time to walk around and enjoy it, it needs to be a really comfortable open space. The, the cutting corners helps with that. But putting like, narrow strip sidewalks on the edge, that are, I mean, like Bay Street, like five feet, doesn't really uh, doesn't accommodate that. Especially as we progress, and more and more people are walk around looking at their phones. You know, there's people still playing Pokemon Go for some reason, and they walk around the park all the time. Um, it is important to have you know big wide spaces for walking. You can walk past people. You can hold hands with somebody. Um, you can stop and talk to somebody and not obstruct the path. That's what makes it more of a communal living space. Um, talking about having um, tables again. I remember when I was younger, there used to be tables. And I remember watching them slowly fall apart. You know, started people, you know, Sharpies being drawn all over them, and then a little bit of destruction here and there. Now, if I go eat lunch in the park, I, I have my lunch box over my lap. And I, I do this a lot, because it's beautiful. Um, but your tables make a big difference in making it a living space where I can go and enjoy a meal with someone. Um, some of the things that I think are maybe less preferential are things like 
you know, we've talked about a big impermeable space uh, by the band shell. It doesn't have to be impermeable. We can use permeable pavers, or also what a lot of parks do um, to keep a, a green space in a place where they have a lot of venue. It's just they level it out, they put a good gravel base, and they have you know different geotextures there. And sometimes grass can still grow through. It's not necessarily that you put fake turf down, but you have enough um, rigid grid material there that you can you know put down a chair and a leg that doesn't sink into the, the soil. Um, those are other things. That help. Um, throwbacks like having using iron um, in the park, I think, make a lot of sense. They look nice, totally not required, but it is a cool throwback to the Victorian era. Um, in contrast, the oval I don't think is as good of a throwback because people don't think about it in a time context. It's just a shape that we see looking at it in bird's eye view. When we're actually walking in the park, even though there's some pitch to it of 11 feet. Right, or 13 feet. We're not really going to see an oval. We're not going to experience an oval the same way. It's just a path for the sake of making a path. That's not to say that we shouldn't have different walkways to get through the park. Um, but almost the other plan that actually had some angular pieces that draw towards nodes on either the long side makes more sense as far as where people naturally want to walk to and make their way moseying through the park. Those are. But, you know, most of the comments I had, I have a lot of nuanced comments. I'm not going to throw at everybody because it's already a long meeting, and I know how late you guys stay here a lot of the time. But that's just my two cents. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Hi. Hi, Mary Scavola, Garden Club, and um, <clears throat> I understand from the plan that the circular garden is going to be shifted to enable <clears throat> that east-west direct pathway from Church Street right down to where the alley is. And uh, <clears throat> I find that really tough to accept because I've worked in the Circle Garden uh, since 72 when I first came with my friends. And, and in 2011, we redesigned the whole thing because it was getting ahead of us. We had these year trees that kept, you know, they grow three feet a year, and we were in there chopping and trying to do that. So we went and researched, and with the help of Jeff Young, and we researched and planted, you know, all kinds of perennials and bushes and things like that. And we knew the height of the bushes and how much it spread, and we thought we'd put more bushes there. Well, we won't need as many flowers. So in the past couple of years, Kelly and the Garden Club and the Master Gardeners have weeded the flowers for us because we pooped out. But um, at any rate, uh, I, I'm tremendously attached to this traditional and historical circular garden. And I, to me, I, I think it's terrific that you could just have some kind of a curve around it, and I would hate to see it replaced. So. I kind of beg you, please, to leave it there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes. Uh, I'm Kelly Wakefield with the Master Gardeners and the Garden Club. Um, everybody keeps talking about the garden and how lovely they are, and it makes me very happy to represent all of our elderly members and young members and everybody that comes, just community <coughs> members that come and help on these projects, weeding, trimming shrubs. We've had a lot of different community members come in working in groups, and it's really great. Um, and as far as me discussing things with all of our garden club members and with the master gardeners, um, our biggest concern was maintenance, because we are doing the maintenance. We have a lot of the, you know, the city, they come and help with leaves and some of the stuff in the spring and fall. So, you know, there's already a lot of maintenance, and we want to make sure that anything that does happen in the park has either a plan or money or allocated or an awesome workforce that they have figured out in some way because as Maria says they're they're getting older and we're having a hard time finding them. Um, so that was the question uh, as far as what are we going to do with maintenance um, but that's for long-term parts to worry about and then as far as the only other comment as you've heard is the, the circular garden um, being removed and 
My only comment as we've gone along through this and Chip and all of our designers know is well, I'm there a lot because I am taking care of the gardens and people come to eat their lunch in a quiet space and this is our tourist destination for our area um, and a lot of flack has been given on a lot of community members because of the splash pad being great for kids and a place for kids to play and it's for all of our community members and I get that and it's a great idea but it should be a quiet place to reflect, to look at the butterflies and the birds and have quiet time when you're on your lunch break instead of seeing kids playing and being rambunctious and parents screaming at kids and having fun and playing time. So that would be the one comment that I have is move it to a different place in the park, not having it so centralized. Other than that, it's a great meeting and I love all these people that are here because it's great to see you. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other comments? Okay, last. Um, my only comment, and, and I think it's hard when people look at a, a drawing and it's rendered and it's complete, they think, oh my God, this is it, it's set in concrete. And I think people have to realize that this is a very conceptual plan, even though it doesn't appear that way. I mean, we met how many times? Eight, eight times. Yeah, you can't come up with a finished plan in eight meetings. I mean, it's really, this is be, going to become a guide. Things will change as we go through the process. And it's a, a living document. It's not going to stay the same. It's going to change. And I dare say that in 10 to 15 years, when this thing is finally implemented, someone's going to pull this out and say, look at what we started with and look what we have now. And it may not even be the same thing. So I just think there's a lot of elements going in here. We asked them to do a lot of things, which they did. And again, just people have to keep in mind, this is really conceptual. And that it's going to change. It's a living document. It isn't something that is fixed. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, my name is Bill Sawyer. And I guess um, my idea of what this meeting is about is that it is conceptual. As Liza said, uh, you know, it's been said, why are we in such a hurry? Well, I don't consider this to be a hurry. I guess the, the, the committee's been meeting for months and months, and this is not a hurry. Nobody's talking about uh, digging up dirt next week. Uh, it is conceptual. What I would hope is that all the folks who are here tonight who have a concern about certain pieces and parts of this will attend the meetings at the city council or whoever else is involved uh, and speak their piece then, uh, where it will be more de definitive into what they want and it can be more uh, brought into the plan uh, in a more specific basis. Uh, so if they would attend those meetings and, and speak their piece, I think that would be a wonderful idea for whichever committee or council is working on. Thank you. Thank you. And I don't know who's raising their hand. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry for the second time. Um, Mary, I just want to thank Barbara for her mention of Ed Loomis, who was a personal friend, and, we, and I sang in the choruses and so forth that he and his wife put on back in the whatever, 70s, 80s. And I think it's a tremendously important to honor uh, the musicians who who uh, were involved in that. And as a personal plug, I can't stand that venue of the overhang. <laughs> I'm sorry, nothing against the artists. No, and, and just to address that, these were three ideas just for a very general, and uh, I'm pretty sure it was consensus amongst the committee that we didn't like any one of those three. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I, I don't want to hear those from yeah. the Yes, but just to follow up on that, we did actually interestingly get a letter from Kevin Loomis um, talking about the whole process his father went through to um, get the bandstand put in, and his actual original intent was a three-sided band shell because of its uh, acoustic abilities. So that was just kind of interesting to know that you know this band stand that we sort of revere isn't necessarily what it was intended to be originally. So. Yeah. Okay, um, anybody else wish to comment? Okay, thank you. Um, this is great. Um, lots of really good, thoughtful feedback. Um, 
very much appreciate it. Um, city councilors, any questions or comments? I was going to say. Okay. And one thing that I, before we um, move forward, just something to think about. Um, there is no rush on this. Um, and that's the, I think the beauty of this process is that we're talking about it at this stage of the game and there's not a rush on this. So um, no decisions need to be made. They can be made to move forward with the conceptual plan. And one of the things that strikes me with several of the big issues that we've been um, talking about this evening is I would be open to um, the notion of continuing an open window for us to take more um, public comment um, on the park. Uh, we recently had a state initiative um, that created a window that was the, the Climate Action Commission to take in comments um, on uh, the, the energy plans. So I ask the council to consider that maybe um, as an action item is that we um, ask um, Don Chip to create a mechanism where we can have an open window for people to uh, provide um, comments. And what I mean is provide comments in um, a way that is um, organized and civil, not a dialogue back and forth necessarily. I think it's important for us to be face to face for those types of conversations, but to go on the record and uh, to be able to say what you like, don't like, speak your piece um, might be useful. Okay, Chad, go. Uh, first, I just want to thank everyone that put time and effort into this. Uh, I volunteer a lot of time. I realize when you're away from your family and uh, sometimes it can get stressful and uh, it does take a lot of time, so thank you. Um, second, is this presentation on the website or can it be put on the website? Yeah, this is on the Taylor Park plan. It's on the... Uh, you just go to the city website slash Taylor Park plan. Okay. Um, third question is, we're not saying that we can't have gardens in the park, right? No, not at all. No, not at all. Okay. You know, I think we've increased the area space. Okay. And then uh, I'm going to acknowledge that I am a huge um, proponent of some kind of water feature for children in the park. So the reason that I like the park is because I can remember swimming in the fountain. So that's where I went to swim <laughs> when it was 18 inches deep and you had to dodge glass. So that's why I like it. My, there's, there's nothing in that park for my son. There's no reason for him to grow up to love the park. So the park is not our backyard. The park is supposed to be inclusive to everyone in the community. So that being said, it doesn't have to be this colorful thing with water cannons and everything. <laughs> the one that I love so much in Boston, it's a granite slab, it has little water that spurts out and the kids, the kids plant it. it if, if you were to drive by, you would just think it was a normal fountain. You wouldn't think that it was something that the kids could play on. When we go to Boston, we go there just to see that, just so the kids can plan it for a little bit, and then we eat at the shops that are right there because we, it's, an hour, it's an hour to get into Boston, an hour to get out. So um, it's just something that we do. Um, if I want quiet, I, I go to my backyard. So um, I just want to make sure that we're inclusive to everyone. There are kids that don't have backyards. They don't have anywhere to go. Um, and having a nice place for them to go to enjoy a little time would be great. I just read something the other day about how uh, water is a stress reliever. So, um, you know, that's just my two cents. Thank you. Thanks. Other comments? I have a question about the, the performance space. Did, did you guys look into um, noise and how a three-sided structure could maybe help with that? And, and the placement, the, some of the comments that folks have had about traffic and noise and how that could really work practically there? We had um, talked during our meetings about the fact that um, we'd like it to be as transparent as possible and not you know, provide blockage of visibility through the park. Mm -hmm. So we talked about some of the detail you can't see in some of these examples are you know, back panels that can turn, you know, that can be turned to provide acoustic uh, solid wall when there's a performance or, and then they turn and they're open. One of them has glass in the back that 
you know, allows you to see through. So we talked about things like that in relation to sound and acoustics, but again, we're not really getting into the detailed design of it um, at the master plan level, so, gotcha. yeah. And just as a point of clarification, the, this plan has the, the existing uh, bandstand in it, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, that was uh, coming out of the Parks Commission, one thing the Parks Commission wanted to do was to make sure it was clear, first of all, that even if the current uh, gazebo was going to be removed, from the park that it would not move anywhere until there was a structure to replace it. Uh -huh. So if that was 20 years down the road, then it would be exactly where it is for 20 years. Um, but also to note that we would do everything we could to try to repurpose it, reuse it, do something with it so it wasn't just torn down and thrown away. Thank you. Um, if, I, if I could speak to that as well. The only thing in the proposed conceptual plan that would conflict with the current gazebo is that overload. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, you know, the Loomis Gazebo, you know, we could stay as long as, as, as folks wanted to. Um, and I would also, I would say that one of the reasons for the location of the performance area is we wanted to find an east-west, uh, sorry, a north-south facing uh, performance space so that the sun would not be an issue for the audience or the performers. Because yeah. if you're a performer in the Civil War Memorial or even the Loomis Gazebo right now, yeah. there's a portion of the evening where the sun is, like you're baking in that. Yeah. Um, and if we were to turn it around, it'd be, uh, be the audience that were feeling that. So to put in a north-south facing performance area and not really intrude upon the main green, which we want to keep open, it, it uh, was put in the south end, which sort of needs something more in it to go along with the memorials. So that's why it ended up there. So yes, I just have a question. Sure. I, and it's probably a stupid question, but I, I gotta ask it anyway. You know, it, it, is there any way to make the existing fountain um, safe for uh, children to splash in it? I mean, what would be to pre uh, why don't we treat that water and not even bother put in another water feature, just make, because every kid wants to go in that fountain. If I'm not mistaken, part of it would be the liability of the standing water. And, and there would be no standing water if you had a, you know, as Chad talked about, the granite pieces where water's just shooting yeah, up. There would be it's zero. not very much standing water. I somehow rather have a feeling that there's a way to do that. But I, I, the, I would answer, we, we had that discussion back when we did the restoration of the fountain about how the water needs to be treated, whether or not the water could be treated, depths of the water, should it be really shallow, just even for safety reasons, apart from letting people be in there. And um, both for chemical interactions with the ladies and trying to keep people away from the ladies even just damaging them by mistake by being next to them. Um, it, 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 the answer to your question is that yes, it is possible in some way to make that found a water feature, but there are many reasons not to. And if the community chose to have a interactive water feature in that park, it's best that it would be a separate installation and that the fountain wouldn't really be suitable for it. So I'm, I'm gonna, um, I can't, oh, so um, we're going to continue on with the council um, comments, and then I'll do a last call for a public comment. Um, we still have a few council members. Kate, you were in the midst of yours. I know. I think that was good. Okay. Mike? I just want to say, uh, in response to, to this, I've talked to a number of people who are really excited about the improved functionality of a performance space. We've never had the kind of uh, performing arts activities that have been going on in the time that I've lived here since growing up. And the idea of having a more functional performance space is really attractive to a lot of people. And I think I'm excited to see that, but I want to make sure that we have that balance between the functionality and being inclusive of the uses that people want to see in the park and also the historic nature, because I know that that would be a huge change. Um, and I just wanted to ask um, Tom and if there was uh, much um, talk about in the sort of you know pivoting from the existing bandstand to a more functional performance space. You know, what are some of the uses that we're seeing, and what's the experience of people in the park, and why propose a more functional space? Because I have a sense of that, but mm -hmm. I'd love to know what the committee discussion was like on that. 
I mean, the discussion is pretty far ranging. Um, I think one of the initial uh, concerns is that while the current gazebo is working for what it's been, and it's very enjoyable, um, it's 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 not expandable. There's very limited space there. Um, in addition to the, the setting sun and um, the kind of poor acoustics that it provides, um, we wanted to provide something that. Um, could meet the growing needs of our community. And one of our charges was to you know, add to the economic uh, vitality of the city and uh, not just to be a place that people who already enjoy the park can enjoy, but people who can come in um, from outside the city and really want to be part of what's going on here as much as we do. Um, as part of that, you kind of need to be able to accommodate a um, large number of people. Um, so the space was an issue um, in addition to the lack of acoustics. And, um, and like uh, Stina had mentioned, um, learning that it wasn't even the you know, desired plan of um, Edric Lewis who uh, put all that effort with the group into making it happen. Uh, it wasn't really just kind of they had to settle for it. And then we had this opportunity to try and provide something that um, was maybe closer to the intended goal. Obviously, I don't have a personal relationship with the Lewis family and uh, can't speak to what was going on at that time directly, but um, from what we've understood from various people, um, that's kind of what we were directed to. I think there's also, um, you know, when you have something that is more like a stage, other opportunities arise. You can have graduations, you can have the kids <coughs> walk across in their Halloween costumes, and, you know, it, there's a lot of different things, you know, it doesn't have to be just for a specific performance. I would add, note that the Mid Festival um, representatives yeah. were pretty excited about the idea of having something that wasn't stage set up, blasting twigs. Um, all weekend long. Um, <laughs> it's, a, it's a small chunk of the year, but it's a big, big part of our usage. Yeah, as uh, Stephen Tatro said, that the Nickel Festival might be able to expand the entertainment that they can provide if they had uh, uh, something more like what was proposed in this moment. Anything else, Mike? Yes. Tim, you got anything? Since I can see that, we're going to table pending further study and further mm -hmm. comment. Just mm -hmm. reserve it. Okay. Let's do that. Um, I know Chad wants another round. Hang on just one sec, Marie. Um, my only concern was we've been talking about asphalt versus concrete. And do I understand correctly that they wanted to put those corner entries as asphalt? Was that the. No? No, we actually um, changed what we had as asphalt. I think we changed mm -hmm. to pigmented concrete. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, in general, we're proposing kind of blasting materials that okay. would, over the, their life, would take less maintenance. Thank you. Um, a couple of questions. Um, I, I'm not sure that I'm clear on um, what the proposal is with regard to trees. I've heard mm -hmm. about installations of some new trees and then removal of others. Can you elaborate on that? That's a very sensitive topic. Yeah, and it's a sensitive topic for the community too. We know it's one thing, you know, we want to preserve as much of our nature in every other tree. And as a as Barbara well knows, that I love the trees in my yard. And we have yeah. discussions about that at times. Um, uh, and, and so um, there are a number of trees, um, partly on behalf of Jeff Young, who's been a big part of the Park for a long time, who was part of both um, uh, a number of boards and the Park the Parks Commission, amongst others. Um, basically, you know, he was made pretty clear to us that there's a number of trees, four to seven trees or so, that have a very short lifespan. If they don't have to be taken down soon, that they will likely come down on their own. Um, and as, um, as for me personally, as sad as that is, uh, it's a reality of of a tree, and um, and I think we try to in the plan it, it identifies both existing trees that would remain because they aren't going to need to come down or aren't in the way of some uh, change in structure, um, in addition to all the new trees that would be added to try and supplement that. Is that how do I read that on the plan? So the kind of the lighter green uh, trees with the dot in the center are the existing trees. Okay. Um, I we. Don't have the trees that we've removed dashed, but um, the darker trees are new trees. Okay. The more kind of yep. um, once it's your branch. Great. Thanks. Yep. Um, and um, yeah, so high high level of sensitivity towards mm -hmm. trees. Mm -hmm. yeah. I will say that um, after this uh, last windstorm that we had a couple of weeks ago, after I checked out my yard, the next place I went was Taylor Park. I was 
concern that we might have had trees um, down mm -hmm. in the park, concern for safety issues. Um, and I hate to see trees go. Mm -hmm. So it just um, want to make sure we're speaking clearly about that. Um, sidewalks, the condition of the sidewalks right now um, it, and timing. Um, we, we can't keep going with some of the conditions of the sidewalks. So how does that play into um, where we are with conceptual plans moving to um, actual changes? <clears throat> Can we do some fixes in the interim? We can't do much until spring. Um, but once the master plan uh, is adopted, then we'll come up with a recommendation for how we deal with some of the sidewalks. Okay. And I'm really happy to hear about lighting um, improvements. Um, I think it is um, dark. If there's anything we can do in the interim, I still think there's some lights that are out um, from time to time. Um, that would be we, we have staff that are going to be looking for the lights that are out. Okay. I know someone who will tell you each light. Give you an inventory. Okay. Um, Chad. You want to do it? You go for it. Okay. I don't know if I have yours exactly. Okay, so I think the goal of the last eight years or so um, has been to push water into the park to act as a filter. So is why the, why are we having that change? Is it just that it's just doing more damage to the park than we thought it was? Is it that the rain gardens that we installed on that edge is just too much maintenance? I mean, I think it's a uh, it's. There's really no change being yeah. proposed. It's okay. just uh, the you know the, the park is a is a really great place for infiltration of water. It drains really well, and I'd say the interaction between our, our plans for the park and what we've done for stormwater and, and any proposed plan here is there are some places where we think new new hardscape would be useful and add to the park, mm -hmm. and we would just. Um, infiltrate stormwater to the edges or elsewhere in the park. I mean, there's a there's a lot of green left on that plan, and there's a lot of open space left on that plan. There are also landscape sp spaces identified on the plan where the um, uh, more stormwater infiltration could offset any new hardscape proposed in the plan. Okay. You mean the curb? Is that what you mean? Yeah, the curb. I mean, that's why we took all the curb out and we well, we put yeah. that special sidewalk in and. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, the, we've learned some lessons about this pervious sidewalk, so yeah. we think a better way to go would be to, to really just get the stormwater infiltrating in the actual grass. Yeah, because it, yeah, it gets clogged up with dirt and it breaks up pretty easy. Okay, that was okay. it. Thank you. And, yes, Mrs. Carmola, I think that's your hand again. <laughs> just a quick question. <clears throat> about the, the uh, kiddie pool with the splashes. Is there a reason why that has to be where the, the uh, circle garden is because of the water pipes and so forth? Can it be a little bit other than where the circle garden is? One thing that has, I don't know how it was amended on here, one thing that the Parks Commission suggested was noting that general area as the possible location for a interactive water feature. Um, uh, given the, like basically opening the door to maintaining that garden and maybe using part of what used to be the reflecting pool as an interactive water feature. But again, you know, with this being a conceptual plan, that would be something that we would lock down very specifically um, when that part of the plan comes through or the funding for that part of the plan comes through. Um, so the, I think, at least from my perspective from the Parks Commission, is yes, there's the possibility that that would not have to replace the That's good. The reason I asked that was, uh, we just barely, it's about three years now that we haven't carried water to the circle. <laughs> <laughs> and we got the nice pipe over there so we could hook the yeah. hose up there. So I thought maybe that pipe would make it so you have to put it there. Yeah, I mean, certainly having access to the plumbing makes it easier, but there's going to be extensive changes in the park, which, you know, that would be part of the plan. Um, and one of the things we'd also like to do is add access to water throughout the park, too, not just have, you know, one spot or two spots where you can get it. So. Yeah, all right, thank you very much. Yes. Just one quick, uh, Joni again. Just one quick note um, that I don't think was brought up as part of the plan because it was an afterthought. But Barbara had an excellent idea to tie Church Street into the park a little bit more, which was to provide uplighting on all the buildings. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's that's I think that could be incorporated easily. I say easily. This is not my job, but. Uh, <laughs> 
but also I think it would just really blend from Main Street up to Church Street to see those beautiful buildings lit at night. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So I think um, we've gotten tremendous feedback. Thank you, everybody. Um, I think at this point, um, I'll look to the council if anybody wishes to make a motion, or shall we just? Um, I'll move we table, uh, pending uh, further uh, public comment and further power commission study. Great. Second. All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? Motion carries. Tremendous thanks for everybody um, showing up tonight and to uh, our wonderful consultants in the, in the commission for doing this great work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, where's Stina? There's Stina. Before you leave, <laughs> uh, we're thrilled to have uh, your photos. They're beautiful. Thank you so much. It will really improve for anyone watching at home on the because they actually have uh, been working on revamping their website. Uh, they have members that pay membership annually to have their advertisements posted and events. So we want to work closely with them so we're not robbing them of that opportunity. So what we've done is we've partnered with them um, to help build up this new tool. Uh, and we've also been working with regional interests, including other uh, community boards that are popping up around the area, including Swan and Unisburg and Richford. Um, that are looking for similar tools, and there's some interest out there for them to actually join us to work with us on this tool. So that community is just beyond just the people in this community, but also the, the actual um, people leading these communities, which is great. So our target target audience was the residents and visitors in and around St. Albans, focusing on families initially, two to twelve, uh, with kids two to twelve, because you know you want to get that out, you can know what's happening with a Taylor Park remaster plan happening, you want to get those events in the park, have like knowledge of it out. I know it's 
not necessarily still. Um, and then seeing as a couple is between 30 and 55, because there's a lot of us out there that just don't know what's going on downtown. I mean, we hear about the different channels, uh, we hear last minute about things, I mean, we want to get that done from people. Um, so what I presented tonight is actually um, a brand guide, um, a mock-up and the actual logo that we've developed, uh, both as a committee, as the board, and as well as working with a private consultant. Um, what the logo allows us to do is it allows us to convey, and I've got notes, stand by, um, encouraging, okay, so the word bubble itself, so the, the little icon, we wanted to play off two things there. We wanted a word bubble so it encourages communication, talking about what's happening in the community, getting people out there and just being able to share what they're doing with the organization. It's not limited to just government or just businesses posting to this. It's everyone that has something going on they want to share. Um, and then it's also a navigation pin. So as anyone that's used Google Maps or Facebook Maps or any of the maps out there knows, there's a pin that pops up and you find something to do. But we wanted to kind of play off both of those pieces. And then the last, uh, or two of the last pieces, the typeface. A lot of times when you see all uppercase, it, it, it denotes kind of a uh, more serious tone. And what we wanted to do is convey a friendly and welcoming um, serif kind of type. So the lowercase kind of encompasses that, hey, it's not this organization, it's not this body of government, it's this fun tool to go use and kind of um, bring people out. Uh, the colors we did present to the uh, downtown board and they were adjusted slightly to be a little bit warmer. Um, initially it was very bright and bold. Uh, we kind of kept with that feel along with a little bit of the warmer tones in there um, because we wanted to encompass uh, Vermont because we, as we know, the warm tones of Vermont. But we also wanted to become something fun, too. We wanted to draw and stand out different to the rest of the community. Um, so all of that kind of came together. Uh, a lot of our work's already been done uh, with the committee, and we've still got a lot ahead of us. Um, we're doing a lot of the organization and the planning, but at this point, we're at, a, we're at uh, sorry, I'm an EMT for too many years, I'm um, thinking of education, but we're at a point where we need to decide um, on our final branding. We kind of need to go forward with whatever we're going to use because the next steps are to do a soft launch, uh, to get the training in place. We're looking at um, a, a social media moderation through the committee, through the downtown board at this point. Uh, we're considering future aspects of sponsorship and um, the partnerships and you know having people that want to join us, like the libraries and other communities that want to chip in funds towards us in the future. Um, sponsors that may want to have their name show up here and there, or have their events pushed to the top, which is fine. We're going to have featured sections and also community sections. That way, you know, just because you pay doesn't mean everybody else gets pushed down. <laughs> Everyone gets seen. Um, so, uh, the downtown board has reviewed and approved the city council review the logo that we just provided. Um, I've also provided a mock up that's not the final mock up of the site. That is a quick mock up to kind of show what it looks like with the tools that we're going to be using. Um, but it's not, it's the next step towards what we want to kind of go down that road. Um, that's going to have more of the final design review within the commit committee, um, obviously with updates coming after we do our soft launch and the feedback. Uh, our timeline, the downtown board and calendar committee are dedicating getting this calendar online as soon as possible. I mean, we've been working on it for the last eight months. We'd really love to get it on live. Um, there's a lot of, as you guys know, this, this movement and things that happen. Um, our goal is to host all the 2018 events, at least for the downtown board on this calendar. So to get it there, we need to get it up, hopefully, at the beginning of 2018. Um, so I'm putting it out there to propose, or hopefully a proposal to get it approved, uh, the brand approved, and move forward with it. If I could just add, just to elaborate, um, both on why the downtown board is doing it and what it could become, is that uh, you know the board, way back when this started, had a desire to make sure that we could find out about events and that people could find out about events in the downtown. And the key strategy has been to see if we could create a regional events calendar that everyone goes to, whether it's in Richford or it's in Fairfield, that if you have an event, you could easily enter it onto this calendar and you, you would think to do so. It would, it would be well branded and it would demonstrate its worth. Um, the reason why it makes sense for downtown to do it is because even if you know these events are entered into a, a calendar called Around Our Town, we can feed them all the relevant ones into our downtown website. So we can, we can include the events of downtown as part of downtown's brand and part of downtown marketing, but they could also exist as part of this, this larger feature that, that there is interest 
with the Swanton Enhancement Project, with the Enosburg Initiative, um, why should everyone be creating their own wheel? Let's have one county events calendar. Because these other community initiatives happening around the county are eventually going to get to the place where they're saying, hey, we need to find a way for people to find out about the events happening in our town. So they could potentially join into this effort, and we'll see if we can get those conversations going. Uh, the top of the chamber is just, just to make sure uh, not to take over the chamber's calendar or and not to try and compete with the chamber's calendar. Let's anticipate a world where they both exist, but create the tools where if you enter an event on one of them, it shows up on the other. Mm -hmm. So once again, you're back to easily for the county, if you have an event, you go to one place, you could enter it in, and then it could propagate um, so that people could find out about it through various different means. Well, I, I like it. Thank you for the, uh, the work to bring this forward. Um, I'd like to see it up and running for 2018. Any uh, additional feedback, comments from the council? What's the URL again? Aroundertown.events and aroundertownevents.com. I tried to type in both of them, so we could lock that down. I still like, some of the .com is still out there. I really like the alternative <laughs> logo with the squiggles. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah, and we, we try to design the logo so you can see, eventually we'd like to get to the point where somebody sees that little icon and they know it's our calendar. It's not just the name has to be attached to it. Yeah. If you see Facebook and Google, I know we're not there, but if you see those, you know they aren't. So. I like your color palette. Did you uh, make sure to check this for visual cue issues like color blindness and there are some color checkers you can make sure um, you're not... I have to check the designer. She normally is pretty good about protection based on those, but I'll make sure. Um, I know that we do switch them over to black and white so you can shades to make sure that those work well so they're not, they're not unclear. Because um, I know you don't want to see one blob of color. Yep. Like that. Yeah. Yeah. What's the software behind this? Uh, I'm actually using, uh, it's called uh, My Events, uh, Event On. Uh, is the brand the company, and I'm basing it on the WordPress site. And so it's a really uh, inexpensive solution that I looked at a couple of open sources and they were just not maintained the way we want them maintained. Uh, and this also offered us the expandability later on of charging for positions too. So if somebody wants to sponsor, they can get a certain amount of posts that are featured posts and stuff like that. So, yeah. And you're still thinking this is a self submit kind of process? We are having two different levels too. Um, one of the ones we're looking at initially is having um, businesses that have, like apply and get trained on it, uh, as well as ourselves be able to log in, create events, and auto post it, and then have the community have the ability to submit events and get moderated. So that way they're not auto posting inappropriate things. So. That's good. Having run a couple of events calendars, I can tell you that this is more than a full time job. <laughs> So just be careful about what you're fighting off. Right now the board is looking at uh, the initial um, having people volunteer for a month here and there to be the moderators, um, and then possible positions later on for both this and the social media aspect of the downtown uh, to possibly take over. Good yeah. yeah, we've been considering, I think the budget was the first thing I laid out and what we need on the <laughs> Looks great. Thanks, we've talked about this for a long, long time. Yeah. Uh, do you need anything else from us at this point? Um, you, you know, it doesn't have to be a motion, I don't think, as long as you know the council's aware and there are no objections being raised, I think we're happy. Great, thank you. Oh. Ryan? Uh, Ryan Boyle, uh, did you say this was an issue from the state downtown board? Or where, where is this? Uh, St. Elmo's downtown, downtown board. Yeah, St. Elmo's okay. downtown so this is a this is a private venture kind of a, a thing? Through the downtown board, so it's, we have an open committee and we have members from around the community joining the committee to help out. So. So, okay, so this isn't a company? No. We were working uh, with local Bridgeville for the consultant work and the build of it, but it's, it's going to be maintained and owned by the downtown. That's awesome. This is 10 years overdue. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, well, that's good. <laughs> and uh, thanks for sticking out to, to the end of the meeting. Yeah. Yeah. Almost the end of the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, Dom, you got an update on Streetlight Dinner. <clears throat> this is Nuts and Bolts. Um, just want to be aware. Um, we've been um, trying to solve the problem of preventing the damage from getting hit. Um, 
exist advantage of 24 inch. Uh, we experimented over the summer. You probably didn't notice with 18 inch. I didn't notice. Yeah. Good. <laughs> um, that's our take too. The plan is the, red, uh, the panels are all going to become 18 inch. Um, there's no significant change there. Go to the third page and figure nine. These are the double ones that are on the bump outs. They're the most proud, they stick out the most. Those are going to be angled um, so that we reduce the likelihood. The wording changes to the downtown instead of stay shop in the Florida words. Um, on the fourth page end, you see all the different colors. There's one that will come out during flag season. Uh, and uh, on the back page, uh, the flags um, on the upper left, the circled one, down or one, they'll be blue. Um, we may experiment with um, putting the city logo at the bottom to take up some of the blue space down there. The geometry changes. Um, the flag can only be so many different sizes. So that's why we had to make this change. Um, just wanted to be able to look in case anybody's asking questions. And with the new flag banners, can we be sure that we're in compliance with proper flag display? We've always been in compliance. The issue is when you put a flag like this, there's a, there's a new point that a flag should never go down. It's always been hung out. That, we crossed that bridge long ago. You know? So what we're doing is in requirement of the rules and our school preference. Thanks. Okay. Is there any questions? No. Okay. Home minutes, uh, 10, 9, 17. Okay. Take a second. I'll second, second but I want to change again. Okay. So second page, Christina, where I recuse myself. Uh, my brother and father work for St. Alvin's class, not field school. Mm -hmm. um, That's it. Good. This was which meeting? This, uh, was, this was regular city yep, council meeting? Yep, 10-9. Yep. Okay. Okay, so um, you did the second? Yep. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? Abstaining? Right here. Okay, one abstention. Uh, move to approve special meeting minutes 10-18. Second. Okay, um, I've got an update on that one. This is, you said 10-18? Yep. Um, minor, but just for clarity. Um, the location in the paragraph with my um, statement. Um, Madison lives two doors down, and the other residence is across the street. They're actually both across the street. Madison's house is two doors down, but across the street. Just want to be clear on that. Anything else? All in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Board abstaining? Motion carries. Board member Warren's 1020. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? Motion carries. Motion, okay. motion to approve Warren's uh, November 9th. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? Motion carries. Other business? Is there any other business? Three quick things. Uh, the clock in the park is off by 10 minutes. Can we get that fixed? Good catch. I noticed that too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, are we having the November 9th clerk, city clerk discussion? November 29th. I mean, uh, November 29th? Yeah. Okay, so November 29th at what time? 6.30. 6.30 here. We'll be having a discussion about um, elected versus appointed city clerk. With the LCT. It's a presentation. Presentation. Yeah, presentation, yeah. yeah. And well, then. Hold on. Well, we've, we've framed it as a forum where there'll be a large portion of the presentation and that's sort of community discussion based on the presentation. Is that different than what you intended? That's we'll what I intended. Okay. Uh, and my last thing is I want to uh, thank NMC. I uh, was up there the other day. Their light poles are very similar to ours and they have the banners. So as you're going down the main road and campus, it looks very much like Main Street. So it looks beautiful. Yeah. And we only lost four of them in the wind storms. How long were they up? Four minutes. <laughs> so right. it does look good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
we might have some big used ones for sale. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I'll just make a quick note of the uh, hotel side door of the parking garage will open in the morning. Mm -hmm. First floor. Huh. Okay. Um, great. I think we are then ready to move into executive session. Okay, we'll Madam Mayor. Oh, yes. May I uh, indulge you? I didn't hear in time because I didn't get her mic. Um, I would like to come up on a new agenda. Noise in the city and the loss of trees. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. And um, in terms of trees, are we at a point where we are ready to do an update on the, we've done the tree inventory? And well, maybe we can connect. Okay. 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 Thanks. Thank you. All right, I'll take a couple of motions. Um, I move that we consider going to executive session because finding that the premature disclosure of real estate acquisitions and personal matters could compromise the city or person involved. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. I move we enter into executive session for purpose of discussing real estate options and personal matters where premature disclosure could compromise the city or persons involved. All in favor? Aye. 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 A